<clears throat> Good morning. <laughs> Let's try this too. Just, just because my last name is Kamalu. Aloha. <laughs> Welcome to Davis Tech and Davis County's annual, fifth annual Community Resilience Symposium on this beautiful snowy day. Can we have a little round of applause for how wonderful this is? My name is Laureen Kamalu and I am one of the three elected Davis County commissioners. I'm a government person, but I didn't used to be. <laughs> And I do a lot of health and human services and criminal justice. Davis County has incredible partners in all of these areas. And it is the Human Services Directors Committee that brings this event to you. Again, this is the fifth annual. I was um, sworn into office in January of 2019 and this was already underway from uh, great people before me. Um, <clears throat> It's an incredible effort and uh, we're in for a treat. I'm missing yoga right now, but I have, I feel like something even better to last all morning. I'm, I'm thrilled, I couldn't be more thrilled having looked forward to this for a whole year. We're gonna first give our thank yous and a little bit of housekeeping. Um, each of the speakers will start at the top of the hour and right before each speaker starts, there'll be a small break so you can stand up and stretch your legs. But I'll come back to this podium right at the top of the hour and um, we'll get going with each of these experts. So um, you can see that we are in Davis Tech in their beautiful facility. And right off the bat, I wanna thank President Brush who is here and um, his expert in technology, Riley Pierce is a big help. Yeah, let's clap for these people. Also, it's cute. We have an epidemiologist up here at the tech table today named Cody <laughs> helping. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Uh, this also would not happen without some of our partners um, to government in the community who are sponsors of this every year. And uh, we do have them listed up here. Intermountain Healthcare, um, Davis Tech, of course, Davis Behavioral Health, Davis Hospital and Medical Center, they are have been sponsoring us for years, and we are so thankful for them. And it's the Davis County Health Department that's the force behind the whole symposium. So please, let's thank our sponsors too. There's an actual um, small subgroup that takes all of your evaluations every year and then we we start discussing and planning for next year's symposium right when this one ends and so i want to especially thank this planning subgroup subgroup of the human services directors committee angie merrill brandon hatch brett lund chad hunt debbie comstock me marcy clark and priscilla jamber let's give them a round of applause please So the reason this event started in the first place is because there were people in Davis County government and people in the community who, who knew that we needed to be pretty intentional to work on resilience. Every single one of us as an individual needs to work on resilience. Every household needs to work on resilience. Every organization needs to work on resilience. I, it's probably always been this way, but it's especially this way now. The last time that we were all together for this symposium was the year number two in 2020. Does anyone remember 2020? <laughs> I was um, the chair of the commission that year. I oversee the health department. Um, we also had an earthquake the day that I was supposed to give a two minute press conference. <laughs> in fact, the biggest um, aftershock happened in the middle of my two minutes. That was good times. <laughs> We had um, a fire that year, a serious fire in Davis County. We had uh, a flood in the middle of a 20 plus year drought um, oh, and the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, these are the times. Um, there are challenges that come with these times, but there's also amazing silver line linings and opportunities that come with these times. 
we've got to develop resilience. So um, our goal is for Davis County to become a trauma-informed community that actually prevents adverse childhood experiences, builds resilience in individuals, families, and communities, provides a safe, supportive, and connected environment, <clears throat> and provides access to treatment for those who have experienced trauma. And we have many partners in Davis County who help us do this work. Since you're here in person and also joining with us online, you were emailed the agenda and the presentation information. And in-person attendees here have this information in your folder. Feel free to utilize that and take notes. I'm a note taker. So um, obviously today's symposium is also being recorded. We have hundreds and thousands of people who watch this from Davis County and beyond. It's becoming a thing and we're really proud of this. So once the recording is ready, you'll receive an email to let you know how to access the recording. I will often review some of the speakers and I share it, and I hope you will do the same. There will be a few pictures taken throughout the symposium. There's Travis. <clears throat> Please check your email for information on how to get continuing education credits, if that's something that you signed up to be able to do. I'm also gonna say right now that in your folder, there is a paper for evaluations. And as I already mentioned, uh, we use these. We read every single one and we get ideas for topics and speakers from your evaluations. So thank you so much for taking the time to be thoughtful and to help us continue to improve this every single year. Um, <clears throat> there's also a, a little drawing as an incentive. A few people will get a prize for submitting their evaluation. All right. Um, it's not quite the top of the hour, so I'm just going to say a little bit more, and then we might start early with our first speaker as well. I want to comment on um, something that sometimes concerns me, and that um, yesterday was our first annual equity symposium. It was wonderful and incredible, and thanks to everyone who participated and planned that event. Sometimes words get hijacked in politics, and I don't like that. <laughs> um, Equity is absolutely, you'll see it in Gabriella's information, equity is absolutely getting upstream and it is preventive when it comes to public health and so many things. So I'm really pleased and proud that uh, Davis County is working specifically on equity as long as, as well as so many of our partners. And I just want that term to be understood. This morning on my way, I don't live far from here. And um, all the years that we've lived here since 1996 in my family, we have seen a gentleman who comes and works at the elementary school that's in our neighborhood, Windridge Elementary. Uh, finally, a newspaper story was done on him and I felt like I got to know him a little bit better from that story, but we have always seen him coming on the bus line um, we see him at the stop after the bus drops him off because he has to cross a busy street, Main Street, and there is a signal that he can press. He, he's he's uh, nearly blind, um, and he works at the elementary school. So he has a button to press, which tells him and his dog when it's good to wait and when it's good to cross, and he has a stick that he uses. He does not have anything across his eyes, but he has a stick. And he uses that and has learned how to find his way. And he is a happy guy. He is contributing to the community. He has a job and he's inspiring to everyone who sees him. I can't even imagine everyone who's inspired by him inside of that elementary school. This is equity. And, um, and we hope that so many will uh, take advantage of all of that's going on in Davis County to be successful and to be contributing and to be aware. It's a matter of awareness and uh, kindness and including all to, to be the best that they can be. That's what equity means to me. Um, and obviously he's an example of resilience as well. Uh, let's see, where are we at? I think we're just gonna start a little early. How's that? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> because it's the fifth year, um, we have some very special people speaking, 
And um, we found them all and hand selected them as a subcommittee and from your evaluations. And uh, I'm gonna say all, three's, all three names and then I'll introduce the first one. <clears throat> so Paris Thomas will be our first presenter, then Sarah Fry, our second presenter, and then Gabriella Grant. Gabriella, for those of you who have been with us for five years, she uh, was our expert in year number one, and we thought it would be really cool to invite her back for the fifth anniversary of this symposium. Gabriella, where are you? I'm trying, I know you're back. There you are in the very, very back. So we're, this is a pretty special that she was with us in year one as a nationally and probably internationally recognized expert, and she's back with us again. Awesome. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I was just talking with Paris. If, if humor isn't one of the most important qualities in resilience, <laughs> I don't know what is, right? So important. All right, so that's our lineup today and we're pretty excited about it. Uh, I'm gonna take credit for finding this first speaker uh, because I'm an alum of three different schools in Utah, higher ed. Um, and the first one of them was, was Brigham Young University. So when I get my alumni magazine, um, I try to flip through it and find what I want to read. And, and by golly, if Paris Thomas wasn't featured in that issue, and I said, boom, <laughs> we need him. We need him to come speak to us. So listen to this. Paris Thomas has the topic of overcoming childhood trauma through confidence. Paris survived homelessness, poverty, gangs, and childhood trauma. Gang violence took both of his brothers. And at age six, he lost his father to incarceration. He joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a teenager and later served a mission to England. After returning home, he served in the United States Navy and completed a three-year tour in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Thank you for your service. He then graduated with a degree in sociology from American Military University with a concentration in social justice. And he is currently a second year law student at Brigham, Brigham Young University. He married his best friend, Jacinda Shelton Thomas. They're both students in the same class in law school in April of just this last year. And they totally look like newlyweds up here. I wish you could all see how awesome it is. <laughs> Please give a very warm welcome to Paris. Can everyone hear me? Just want to make sure. Got to fix this so everyone can hear me. How about this? Is this better? Can everyone hear? Okay. And in the back, can you hear me? Probably not. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to uh, to speak to everyone today. I'm so grateful to Davis County for for having me, to Commissioner Kamalu for reaching out to me, uh, to Marcy uh, Clark as well. Um, I just can't tell you, you know, how excited I am to, to be here with everyone. Um, I'm grateful to all of you for being here. Um, you all are educators, law enforcement, business leader, therapists, medical care providers, politicians, clergy members, and nonprofit volunteers. You all come from various backgrounds, but you share one thing in common, and that is you have an interest in helping people who suffer from and deal with adverse childhood experiences. And I just want you to applaud yourselves actually for being here. Give yourselves a round of applause for, for taking the time to be here and, and, and to learn about this topic. So let's see if, if my clicker works. Some of the slides are a little silly because I'm a silly person. So I'm not, I'm not a cl clinician at all. So that is my wife. And I know you're all thinking like, wow, he's a howdy, howdy getter. And if you stick around, you might find out how actually. But here's our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my life. I'm going to introduce some terms of art that you all are probably familiar with. Um, and then I'll, I'll end and we'll have time for questions. 
All right, so as far as the terms of our, I want to talk about adverse childhood experiences. So ACEs or adverse childhood experiences are major childhood trauma before the age of 18 that includes neglect, abuse, and household challenges. This trauma can result in changes in brain development and may affect a child's social skills and ability to learn. Average childhood experiences can result in long-term health problems as well, as you all know. About 61% of adults surveyed across 25 states reported that they have experienced at least one type of average childhood experience before age 18. And nearly one in six reported that they had experienced four or more types of ACEs or average childhood experiences. So these are very common as you. So why did I choose this specific topic? I chose this topic um, in part because of a speech. On July 15, 1979, President Jimmy Carter addressed the nation via live television to discuss the nation's energy crisis and accompanying recession. So this should sound familiar to all of us. Carter prefaced his talk about energy policy with an explanation of why he believed the American economy remained in crisis. He recounted meeting, a meeting he had hosted at the presidential retreat in Camp David, Maryland, with leaders in the fields of business, labor, education, politics, religion, and other industries. Although the energy crisis and the recession were the main topics, Carter heard from the attendees that there was a deeper crisis plaguing the American people, a deeper moral and spiritual crisis. To quote President Jimmy Carter, he said, we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. We've learned that piling up material goods cannot fill the emptiness of lives which have no confidence or purpose. So President Jimmy Carter spoke of a crisis of confidence. Now I am aware of history and I know that after Jimmy Carter gave this speech, he went on to lose his election. So if I suffer a similar fate, I may never be asked to speak again. <laughs> but that's what I wanna focus on today, the role of confidence and the role of purpose in helping those like myself who've dealt with adverse childhood experiences. So this is a perfect segue into my favorite topic, which is me. So this is a picture of me at six or seven years old. And this is one of the few pictures I have of myself around that time. And I know what most of you are thinking. Most of you are thinking, it looks like the 90s threw up on me. And some of you are thinking, man, I want that turtleneck that he has on. And then some of you are probably like, well, why does he look like that? And so I have a condition called RCF. Are you all familiar with RCF? It's kind of like RBF. So it's called resting confused face. So as you can see, it hasn't changed much. Um, I, I generally look confused in most situations. And to be honest, generally I am confused. And so, yeah, I have RCF. Um, if you're wondering why I look like this today, it's because of that. So. so I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I lived in a subdivision called Jonesboro South. My family at the time, it consisted of my mother, had two older brothers, a younger sister, and my father. At the time, Jonesboro was a very rough area. It was very common to see people who were in gangs. It was very common to see people who died due to gang violence. Um, sometimes I would look outside and, you know, see a dead body as a child and, and be very scared. It was common to hear gunshots uh, ringing everywhere. It was also very common to see people who were addicted to drugs. And this was actually the case in my home. My father, who was an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago, was heavily addicted to cocaine at the time. And this caused a lot of tension in my home. My mom, she worked different food service jobs uh, like McDonald's and other places just to bring home money to support me and my siblings. And my father, he would often take the money that she would bring home uh, in order to support his drug habit. So this meant that oftentimes there was little to no food left for us kids. When she would confront my father about this, he would beat her in front of us. 
he was a very verbally abusive person to me and my siblings as well. I was afraid of my father. I hated him. But more than anything, I didn't want to be like him. The gang environment that I grew up in does not look kindly on weakness. And so to me, this meant compartmentalize your emotions and never lose control the way that he did. So I was an angry child, but I was also someone who went other way to push their emotions down and hide them. And with nowhere to place these emotions, I became very self-loathing. I hated myself. And this bled out into my schoolwork and my confidence as well. By the time I was four years old, my oldest brother Sheldon died due to gang violence. And even though I was too young to understand why he was gone, I knew that I had lost someone important in my life. At six, my father was incarcerated. And this was partially a miracle to me. My mom relocated us to Alabama from Georgia, hoping to find a better life for me and my remaining siblings. The lure of gangs was too strong. And at the age of eight, my closest brother, Jeremiah, died at the age of 18 due to another shooting. Jeremiah would be found in my grandmother's backyard. I remember being in school and my mom came and I was happy because I thought she was picking me up to do something nice or to go out and have fun. She said, do you remember what happened to your brother Sheldon? I said, I do. She said, well, the same thing has happened to Jeremiah. And she started to cry. And even though I knew crying was for wimps, I did too. Um, my mom, perhaps hoping to again provide a better life, decided to take me and my younger sister, the remainder of her children, and stay with family in New Jersey. And when that didn't pan, that, pan out, we found ourselves homeless and our 80s Mitsubishi Mirage became home. So that's the car that we used to drive all the way from Alabama to New Jersey. And I remember one New Jersey night, I was sleeping in that car uh, as a youngster and my hands were so cold and frozen and I couldn't feel them. And I, I just couldn't believe how cold I was. And these were tough times. We stood in line at soup kitchens. We also ate one of my favorites, mayonnaise sandwiches. That's where you take the two end pieces of bread and you kind of slather mayonnaise on them and, and you kind of eat that. And I don't really remember even attending third grade. Eventually we moved into a YMCA shelter full of other families like ourselves that were homeless. It was basically a huge gymnasium that we would all stay in and it was full of cots, just rows and rows of cots. And we had to be out by 7 a.m. every day. And it was there though that we started to get traction in our lives. And this is something I wanted to focus on. There was actually a, a volunteer at that shelter named Elise Descalzi who changed things for me. For some reason, she saw this kid with RCF with a resting confused face and, and she took an interest in me and she took an interest in our family. She helped us find affordable housing. She even got me an academic scholarship to attend sixth grade at the same private school that her son went to. I became very involved in my education at this time and I thrived at the private school. And even though I was one of a few black students, I was treated just like everyone else. My mom also enrolled me in any activity that she could to keep me out of trouble so I wouldn't suffer the same fate as my brothers. And when I say any activity, I mean any activity. So I have a, another picture here. So this is a picture of me and my sister and we're enrolled in a ballet tap dance class. So she really did enroll us in everything. And some of you are thinking, is that a baseball t-shirt? And it is. And some of you are thinking, how can I get the suede pants that he has on? And then others of you are like, why does he look like that? And again, the RCF. My mom saw me up hoping that, that I would stay out of trouble. And it turns out that gangs don't really want someone named Paris who takes ballet and tap dance. And this is kind of like really off topic, but you can stop me if I get too crazy. But uh, I remember I was taking this ballet tap dance class and it was like, 
you know, late and I went to go talk to one of the instructors, the dance instructors, and, you know, I'm overhearing her talking to another dance instructor, one of the teachers, and she is talking about me. And so I just hide on the side, you know, because I want to hear what they're talking about. I'm about 12 or 13 at the time. And she says, Paris is a good kid, but he just can't dance. <laughs> and so that's when my Ballet West dreams ended, like right then and there. And so that's when I put all my energy into basketball. And so I have a picture of that too. So which one is me? Just guess. Um, and what I found out, some key takeaways, I wasn't really good at basketball either, as you can tell by the goggles and everything else. Um, I played power forward for Holy Trinity Interparochial School, a Catholic private school. I think the whole top row was named Matt. And uh, I averaged zero points, zero rebounds, uh, zero assists. Um, but we won two tournaments while I was on the bench. So I think I contributed a lot to that. But what I really learned was, and wanted to emphasize to, to you all is, the role of educators, the role of volunteers, and really saving my life. And not only that, helping individuals that suffer from adverse childhood experiences. A family tragedy uh, saw us move back to Alabama uh, from New Jersey. My mom's sister, my aunt, had lost her son uh, due to him taking his own life. And so we packed up and went back to Alabama. The same forces that influenced my brothers uh, started to influence me at that time. And I started to understand why the allure of gangs was so strong. The money, the camaraderie, the sense of belonging all resonated with me and a lot of my friends. And so many of my friends at that time started to sell drugs. They joined in on drive-by shootings. Uh, there was gang fights that often extended into, into uh, the school grounds as well. And I remember one particular day, uh, my first day and one of my first few days in high school, I saw some friends of mine, they were just beating up a, another young man in the, the bathroom of the school. And I just didn't want to follow that path. I didn't want to be like that. And so I decided to drop out of school. I dropped out of high school. This didn't help my situation, actually. And I found that it really increased the allure um, of gangs because I had so much free time. And it was around this time that I ran into missionaries from a small local church called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Um, it was a small local church, small local church. And uh, so these missionaries, they knocked on our door of, of where we were living in Alabama. And I did what any 14-year-old uh, would do, and I tried to close the door on them. But my mom, she saw the badge, and it said Jesus on it. And any good Southern woman is not going to close the door on Jesus. And so she let them in, and... I was pretty mad about that. Um, but eventually we did join the church and my heart softened. Now I don't wanna focus so much on my conversion story here. Um, and I can send out information if you wanna hear more about that. But what I wanted to key in on is what the church provided to me as a young teenager at this time that I think is important for the work that you all do and helping those with adverse childhood experiences. So the church gave me like-minded friends. It gave me a sense of family and belonging that filled my life with hope. Remember earlier when I talked about the allure of gangs. And so this is important. I remember one day uh, someone asked me, they were like, you can join, like you can join our gang. And I was, I was young at that time, uh, around 15 or 16. And he was like, you don't even have to go through initiation. And that was the process where either you have to get beat up or you have to do something illegal to join. And so that was a sweet deal to somebody like me. The, the offer to have the camaraderie, the employment, the ability to buy the things that my family never had and seemingly no strings attached. But the church filled a lot of those needs for me at that time. 
And I had the strength of conviction to, to tell my friend, no, I, I didn't want to join uh, the gang. Through my mentors and the congregants in the church, I was able to obtain a GED. And when I say they dragged me to GED lessons, they really did drag me to GED lessons. And eventually this led me to attend college at, uh, they call it Ensign College now, but it was LDS Business College um, in Salt Lake City, Utah at the age of 16. And I was far from the influences that I dealt with um, at home at the time. And I served a mission for that small church in Alabama uh, in the British Isles in the mighty England Leeds mission. All right, oh, how did that get in there? Okay, let me switch that. Someone snuck in some slides, I think. So shortly after my church mission to the British Isles, um, I enlisted in the Navy in 2015. And I, cause I, I wanted to give back to a country that I felt had given me so much opportunity. Um, there was one problem when I joined the Navy. I didn't know how to swim. And it turns out swimming is actually a key element of the Navy. And so I didn't actually put together Navy and swimming. And I remember there was a swim test, ironically, that you have to pass to get into the Navy. And they have this large platform that you have to dive off of and you have to swim back and forth. And there's a whole line of people and they're slowly climbing up this platform and you're seeing them go up. And then you see the Navy instructor gently assist people <laughs> off the platform. And you see this until it's your turn. And so to someone that didn't know how to swim, the platform looked about 700 feet high and the water looked just as deep. And I felt like I couldn't even see the bottom. And then I was gently assisted in the water by the Navy instructor. And guess what happened? I, I drowned. <laughs> it turns out that's what happens when you join the Navy and you don't know how to swim. I had to take that test every single day for a month. And I failed a lot. And it taught me something that I think is important for those that you interact with that deal with adverse childhood experiences. Failure is natural and never be afraid to try again. Many, many of the people that you deal with don't think that failure is a part of life and that they can be different from before. But it's also important to let them know that getting out of your comfort zone and failing is also a part of success and overcoming adverse childhood experiences. Um, you can kind of sum up my beliefs in this quote. It says, if you treat a man as he should be and ought to be, he will become what he should be and ought to be. If you treat a man as he is, he will remain as he is. Um, to drive this home, I want to share another principle that the Navy taught me and while I was in the military. So while in the military, I was stationed in a place called Meridian, Mississippi. And Meridian, Mississippi is adequately named because it's in the middle of nowhere, Mississippi. And I was assigned to work in the mail room at that time because I was in training. And I like this job because I was inside and I didn't have to do the other things that other sailors that were on the base had to do. Like I didn't have to sweep the air or like mop outside or something crazy like that, that our superiors would have us do. And while there I was working with another sailor and we got along really well. But at one point he looked me in the eyes and he says, I don't like black people. Now this made me nervous because I just so happened to be black. <laughs> And it turns out he hadn't spent much time around black people and that's why he felt this way. He even confessed to me that he was dating a black girl, the only one from his small town and that his family didn't approve. And me and him talked about this and I said, that's quite the conundrum because you don't like black people. <laughs> For some reason, I felt very strongly that I should befriend this person. And over the next few months, we did become great friends and we became closer. I don't know if he changed his ways, but I do know that I learned something from him. See, he was not my enemy. We were both enlisted in the military. We wore the same uniform. We were protecting the same country. He wasn't my enemy, but his ignorance was. And oftentimes we work with people and we interact with them 
and we consider them enemies, but our true enemies are ignorance, poverty, and ideologies that divide. How would the world change if we realize that we are all on the same team, that we're all a part of a common thread, that our enemies are not those that we see every day? I just want to kind of tell a quick story that kind of drives us home and, uh, and close. And then uh, if you have questions, which I'm sure you will about my RCF or other things. Um, but it's one of my favorite stories and comes from my hometown of Tuskegee, Alabama, where I was raised. And Tuskegee is a very historic black town. Um, these are some of the people that were there. There's Booker T. Washington, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Lewis Adams and others. Rosa Parks was actually born in Tuskegee. A lot of people don't know that. And if you like Lionel Richie or the Commodores, they actually are from Tuskegee as well. <laughs> and that's kind of our claim to fame. But there's one person that I wanted to focus on and that's, that's Lewis Adams. Lewis Adams was a former slave born in Macon County, Alabama. And despite having no formal education, this man, Lewis Adams, could read, write, and speak several languages. And he was an experienced tinsmith, harness maker, and shoemaker. He was a leader in the black community of Tuskegee at that time. In 1880, Lewis Adams was approached by two white candidates who wanted to join the Alabama Senate. And one of those candidates was a man by, by the name of W.F. Foster, a former Confederate colonel. Rather than requesting and accepting money or gifts, which was common back then, uh, Lewis Adams, uh, who knew that W. F. Foster wanted the votes to get into the Alabama Senate from the black uh, people that he was over, made a deal with him. And he said, I'll get you the votes if you, when you get in the Alabama Senate, you get the money to start a school to educate blacks in Tuskegee. And to his credit, he did that. W. F. Foster, that old Confederate colonel, kept his word. Now, it doesn't end there. There was also a banker, George W. Campbell. He was a former slave owner, and he skillfully convinced the Alabama legislature to begin funding of $2,000 annually for the Negro Normal School in Tuskegee, starting in 1881. It was also George Campbell, the former slave owner, that worked with Adams to recruit and hire another former slave a brilliant young man by the name of Booker T. Washington out of Hampton, Virginia to become the first principal of Tuskegee University or the, the first uh, president. So there's a lot that we can learn from this story. You have a, a former slave, a former Confederate colonel, a former slave owner, all working together to do something that's still standing to this day. When you hear this story, I want you to think about Lewis Adams, but I also want you to think about W.F. Foster, and I want you to think about George Campbell. When you see a thug, when you see a homeless person, I want you to think about W.F. Foster and George Campbell. And I want you to remember that we can change. We can be better than we were before, and we can always work together. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much, Paris. It's really inspiring. I pulled out of the folder the learning objectives. You might want to take a look at those because I think he hit. I got off topic. <laughs> <laughs> you hit them. We really learned some real life uh, experience about ACEs um, and um, the barriers that that individuals have oftentimes that community leaders and invested parties um, sometimes in in reaching out and relating to individuals can change a trajectory yeah and gaining insight um, about what it's like in all the different populations and and challenges that are that are common right lots of things um, so this is the time that people can ask questions I think when I'm sitting down, then they only hear a voice online. <laughs> so I'm the voice, but I'm going to sit back down. <laughs> you can ask about my art. 
So because I'm gonna I'm gonna take questions from the chat and the room. So you may have thought of some things you might, would like to understand better or think about your profession, your place in your community and your family, you know, in, in any way. Um, love to have questions in the room. If you'll raise your hand, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, if you won't, don't mind saying your name and then your question and I'll repeat it for those who are online. <laughs> so the question from uh, someone working in the school district thank you that was a great question um were you born with humor and confidence or how did that develop were you intentional about it that's a great question well a lot of uh and that's a great question a lot of the good qualities I have, just like most people come from my mom. My mom had a very rough upbringing, um, very hard life, but she is one of the funniest people you will ever meet. And even when we were homeless, she always tried to find a silver lining or find the humor in situations. Um, and so I wasn't born a naturally personable or confident person. I was a very shy, kind of self-loathing child. Um, but just my mom, just being the person that she is, um, I, I get a lot of that from her and a lot of my good qualities come from her. All the bad stuff, that's just my own doing um, from, from years of living. But um, yeah, so I wonder I didn't turn out better with a mom like that. So, uh, but yeah, it, it, a lot of that just comes from her. So thank you. There is one online. So let me go back and forth a little bit. Michelle, online, uh, when people ask you what is social justice, how do you respond? That's a good question. Um, that, that is a really tough one because um, if you look at the civil rights movement, which I studied a lot of uh, in Tuskegee, um, there, there was always like two schools of thought. You had like W.E.B. Du Bois, who was more about social justice, right? He started the NAACP, which which I'm a member of. And then you had like Booker T. Washington, who was from my hometown. And he was more about like economic justice. And so social justice um, is more closely tied to, I think that civil rights movement when I, when I think of that. Um, the things like economic justice can lead to social justice, um, but those are just two different strategies and ways of dealing with things. Um, I think when I think of social justice, I just think of like, you know, like that kid, you know, being, you know, that I ran into in the Navy being nice, you know, stuff like that. It's not really like legislation or policy or anything like that. It's just treating people with decency and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what I think when I think of, uh, of social justice. But as far as like how to accomplish all those things, I have like no idea. I'm not a clinician. <laughs> I'm not like an expert in, in any of those kind of fields. But um, yeah, there's social justice and economic justice, and I'm, I'm never quite sure which one to focus on at any given time. Um, and I, I, I still don't know who was right between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, you know, so, so I can't really help with that. That's interesting. Well, in my opening remarks, I mentioned um, yeah. awareness. Awareness is a big part of it, right? When you're mom and you teach your kids to notice a child that no one is interacting with who seems lonely and quiet, uh, that's awareness, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's not so much like policy or, or legislation uh, per se, but it's more just treating each other with kindness, treating people with dignity, and seeing people um, as children of God, as as people, you know, a part of a common thread. So, like the way I looked at that young man who who I ran into in the Navy and many other people, just seeing their potential. Uh, Lewis Adams, when he saw the potential with W.F. Foster and George Campbell, right? That's that's like social justice to me. So working together to do things like that. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. There's some wonderful uh, comments and, and lots of appreciation online here. <laughs> um, here's, oh, let's get the one in the room. Yes, please. Thank you. I, 
nice. Thank you for your service. Wow. That's amazing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a How do you question. open the door of opportunity when there's so many barriers and and experiences that are difficult? And thank you for your service as well. Yeah. I'm I'm Navy, but I can say nice things about Air Force. <laughs> so, um yeah, that's that's a great question. I think um Wow, that is a really good question. How do you open the door? I, well, a lot of people, especially young people that I work with that come from a similar background as me, um, they're very, sometimes you can get very comfortable with uh, your circumstances. And it took people believing in me um, for me to, to realize that I had more potential and greater potential than I thought. Cause I thought my potential was like my brothers, right? I thought that I was going to be in a gang. I was going to sell drugs, probably die at 16. You know, I kind of resolved myself to that. Um, but I had people along the way that were like, no, that's not who you are. You have greater potential than you can imagine. I remember when I passed the GED, I was genuinely shocked. So I didn't think I was a, a particularly smart person or, and, and if, you know, the person I am now, like after, you know, getting into law school and being in the Navy, if I could talk to that young person and tell them all this, they wouldn't believe it either. Um, so having people along the way um, that can remind you of who you are and remind you of your potential is, is so important. Um, because a lot of times young people, they, they feel like, oh, you know, this is how it is and, and this is my my destiny. But when you have people that can kind of shake you and say, oh, that's not who you are, you know, I, I think that makes a, a lot of difference for people. So, but thank you for that question. I hope that was helpful. Paris, did you have anyone who, uh, you said someone who can you know, shake you and remind you, I mean. And kick you and kick, I mean, mothers do oh, yeah. this, I do this. I'm, exactly. you know, sometimes it's loving and sometimes it's, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, did you have some people like that? Oh, definitely, definitely. I remember uh, my mom was definitely one of those people. I mean, she signed me up for ballet tap dance. So um, yeah, like some of the missionaries that I, that I ran into, there was one particular missionary um, Elder Rigby, and he saw that I wasn't in school when I when I joined the church, and he dragged me to GED lessons. He literally kicking and screaming, like, because I I didn't I was like, why would I want to go to school if I'm not, you know? And so he he did that, you know, and I'm so grateful to him for that now. And he actually, I don't know if this is allowed now, but he had me like. He's like, oh, you're not in school, you're going to be a missionary. And so I would actually like go with the missionaries every day, even though I wasn't in school, you know, after seminary. And I would teach my friends in my hometown. And so things like that. Um, th there was always people that, you know, either a missionary or my mom or people at church or, you know, volunteers that I met in a, in a shelter that really were there to like kick me in the butt, you know. And I, and I needed that because some of us are a little more hard headed. So. I feel like we all need a kick in the butt now and then. <laughs> I still need a kick in the butt. <laughs> well, that's how we get married. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, some more great ones online. I'm just going to try to go back and forth. So hold your hand up like, after this. Um, <clears throat> this is another question online. What is the from Jen, thank you. What is the best suggestion you have for us 
to begin to foster relationships with those who are different than we are, whether it's, it's beliefs, whether it's race, whether it's gender, um, particularly here in Utah, now that you've lived in Utah for a while, you probably have some insight. Yeah, no, um, it, it can be hard to, to get out of your comfort zone and meet people um, who are different. So I think that's normal to do. But I always think of Elise Descalzi. She was this woman that was a volunteer in the shelter for the shelter in New Jersey. And, you know, she didn't have to do that. Like she was pretty okay financially. She had a lot going for her. There was no reason for her to take an interest in me. There was no reason for her to help me. I had RCF, right? And so there, there was no reason for her to, to reach out to me the way she did, but look at how it changed my life by her doing that one simple thing. It gave me hope. And so, yeah, just, you know, if, if there's people that you feel trepidation about being around, go be around them. That's my biggest advice to people is go outside, right? Turn off TV, turn off your phone and go meet people, go into the communities, um, do what Elise did. And so, you know, if there's people that you feel trepidation about, just go be with them, you know, join the NAACP chapter, join, you know, organizations that, that have causes that you may not support necessarily. Um, but yeah, get out of your comfort zone and meet people who are different because that's where a lot of growth happens is when you're not in your comfort zone. And for a lot of people, a lot of children that come from a background like me, that's scary to get out of your comfort zone. It's scary for adults too, but like how else can you grow? I just don't know any other way you can grow unless you, you dive off the 700 foot platform or you know, it might take some, a Navy instructor pushing you in, right? But get out of your comfort zone because that's where the growth happens. That's why, you know, I'm here right now is because I had people pushing me and I was, you know, given opportunities to get out of my comfort zone. Yeah, thank you so much. Years and years ago, I had a neighbor who invited me to a panel where she had friends um, uh, who are uh, with a different uh, sexual orientation and they were doing a panel. She invited me to go. And I was like, why would I go? And then I thought, well, why shouldn't I go? <laughs> that would be very interesting to to learn and see what this panel is all about. And so glad I went, you know, years and years ago. Important to understand. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think another question in the room, Becca. Yeah, Becca Carson. So, you know, you said it was a little surprising that you came to the community. What has education played in your role? What role has that played? Yeah, yeah, that's a. I'm just going to repeat it yeah. in case they couldn't hear online. So, yeah, getting your GED and what role has education played? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, yeah, it's, it's been very important. Um, education's played a huge part. I think um, my aunt is probably a good example of this. Um, she was someone who, she became pregnant at 16. Um, she, she's someone I'm very close to as well, but she became pregnant at 16. She didn't have a lot of options, and, but she was able to get into um, a college where she could finish her two-year degree. And then that led to her being able to finish a bachelor's. And then she was able to work at the local university for years and years. Now she wasn't rich, you know, but she was able to take care of, you know, herself and help with family things when she needed to and, and provide. And so education is, is so important. And that doesn't always have to be college. I think, I think sometimes like technical schools or, you know, vocational schools are very good. And so everyone, you know, kind of has different things, but a lot of the guys where I was from, the reason that gangs were so alluring is because if you take a gun out of somebody's hand, you got to put something in it. And so if, if that's education like me, that's great. But if it's a vocation, if it's employment, that's also great too. So if you take something out of somebody's hand, you need to fill it very quickly with something else. Um, church played a huge role in that as well. So I wouldn't say that it's only education, but you, you have to fill, you have to fill that with something, right? Because imagine if I didn't have church or, or other things, you know, to fill that gap. I, I don't know where I would be. 
Okay, looking to see if there's there is an awesome one online. A question that I want to end with, but any more in the? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, more. Yes, in the back. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're repeating some of the question online. Yeah, we want to know curious minds. Now, um, <clears throat> you might not bring this up, so I'm going to bring it up. The question online is wanting to know a little bit more. Do you speak? He and he does. He's ever since, especially that article in an alumni magazine that goes around the world. He's been on people's radar. Um, but you also ran for county commission yeah, that's right. as like a 23 year old or something. Yeah. I mean, I was almost 50 before I even <laughs> knew what that was. <laughs> yeah. How did I land here? I don't, I still ask myself. So yeah, great questions. If you can remember all those parts. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so the first question, yeah, I've, I've always been involved in uh, helping youth and speaking at different things. Um, especially this past year. So I've, I've spoken to a lot of youth. So this is, I think this is the first time I've spoken to like academics and adults and people like that. So yeah, I've, I've um, I, I definitely love helping and, and giving back in that way. Um, in fact, when I was back home before law school, I, I was in Tuskegee and I would volunteer at a girls group home. And that was so like such a wonderful experience. And I learned so much from them. And so, yeah, I love to give back and I love to speak. As you can tell, I'm very talkative. So yeah, any any kind of way that I can help and give back, I'm always open to. And then the second part was how old am I? So I'm I'm 31, so I look a lot younger, but I'm I'm not a I'm not a young young guy. So yeah, Navy took Navy took a lot of my stuff. <laughs> Good job. I, I'm younger than some people, but yeah, Navy took a lot of my my 20s. So uh, my heart belongs to Davy Jones. No, I'm just <laughs> But um, yeah, and then there was a third question. I'm, oh, my, yeah, my mom, she actually, her and my sister, all my family, my aunt, like they're all still in that, that area in Alabama. And so her health isn't the best. Um, she does dialysis and stuff like that. So that's like limited her a lot, but she's still funny and has a sense of humor and always getting into trouble. And, you know, she, she's an awesome, awesome woman. She's really the hero of the story. And that's what I hope people get from it. And I don't want people to think that I'm special at all because that's that's the thing is like uh, the people that I ran into, they might have seen something in me, but that's not because I was special. That's because they were special. That's because you all are special. The people that are helping these these people are special. And and you can help anyone the same way that I was helped. And And that's the thing, it could be anybody, so. Yeah, I think that's really true. There is, or there are special things in every person, but uh, people who see that when it's not as obvious or sense that mm -hmm. when it's not as obvious, that is, that is a gift yeah. and uh, it's pretty wonderful. Yeah. And I think a lot of people in this room and online have that sort of gift. It's why you've chosen the occupations you've chosen. Yeah, good for you. So yeah, you all are the, the special ones. Like I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> Okay, there was another one in the room. Yes. Um, well, you kind of touched on this a little bit, and you talked about because of your injury, you started to get some of the tendons to kind of recover over and mm -hmm. you kind of gouge and um, you're very uncertain about what also gets you to kind of lose some of your hair and stuff like that. And you said that you could overcome that. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so the question, uh, I mean, it's how do you shift your mindset? And I would say you know, it, it has mental health. That's a good question about mental health, right? We all have times that we doubt. We all have times that we are discouraged. We all have times that are, you know, overwhelming. Uh, and how, what, what advice for that? Yeah, I, I'm so grateful that um, Sarah and Gabrielle are here because they can debunk anything that I say, because I'm not like a clinician, so I, I can't speak from like a clinical perspective, but I guess from like a practical or like lived experience thing, um, something that helped me to kind of get over that self-down, self-loathing was like, when that Navy instructor pushed me in that pool <laughs> and I had to swim, right? It, like those kind of experiences where you get out of your comfort zone, um, you know, that missionary who dragged me to GED lessons, even though I didn't think I was smart, right? Um, just having opportunities to get out of my comfort zone over and over, speaking in front of people, um, that helps to build confidence. And so um, having those opportunities to get out of my comfort zone are, are the main things. So, so like, yeah, definitely when I joined the Navy, that was like way out of my comfort zone, right? Going on a mission, super out of my comfort zone. Uh, being in law school is out of my comfort zone. But just doing those those kind of things over and over again, you help you to build confidence, and that's important for people who, who have, um, who may deal with average child experiences, is just pushing them out of their comfort zone little by little, you know, and then eventually you see like, oh yeah, I can do that, yeah, I can I can speak in front of people, you know. So thank you. Good good practical advice. I think there was another one in the room. Yeah. Great, let's do this one, and then I have. Any others in the room? Just so I kind of know. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's get yeah. these couple more in the room and then I'll close with this one online. Yes. Go ahead. Right here. Yes. Yes. You. Yes. Why did Paris choose law? That's kind of related to another one online. Yeah. And what, are you, what do you plan to do with that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. That, that's a good question. I think, I think losing my brothers was like when I had like maybe an awakening in some ways as a child, because I didn't know what forces kind of led to that. And so I, I guess I was always interested in like things from a policy perspective um, and understanding like why, why certain things exist or why people live in certain circumstances or just, just understanding that. And then when I joined the Navy, um, when I was in, uh, Guantanamo Bay when I was stationed there I met a lot of attorneys there um, and I was just so impressed uh, with them and, and how they use their their law degree to protect the rights of everyone and so yeah that's when I, I got the crazy idea I was like well yeah I could I could probably do that and so um, that voice came back there was like oh you're a high school dropout right you can't really you, you think you can be a lawyer you know and but then you know you have you remember the people that have pushed you out of your comfort zone. And so I applied to law school. Miraculously, I got in uh, to law school. Um, I'm still in law school, miraculously. And uh, I met my wife there in law school as well. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of how I, I got involved in law. So I, I would say I started in my childhood, like just wanting to understand you know, why things exist. And as far as what I want to get into, I definitely want to work like in government in some capacity. And so like uh, commissioner, so I ran for county commissioner and, and hey, at 23, was, I think I was a little older, but it was a, <laughs> I was a 20 something. So yeah, it's pretty unique. Yeah. So definitely want to get involved in, in government and, and work in policy in some kind of way, but I'm not sure yet. Well, we certainly need people like you. Oh, thank you. He'd make a pretty darn good county commissioner, don't you think? <laughs> okay, let's see. There was another one. Yes, over here. Yeah, yeah. So my dad. His dad, he wants to know in, uh, interaction with his dad after he was incarcerated and 
definitely online. Like they want to know about a family update status, sort of a thing. Yeah, <laughs> we feel close to you. Oh, and they want your contact information. Yeah, so think about no, that. Reach out to me. Definitely reach out to me. Um, so my my dad, he was incarcerated when I was six, uh, of course. And so since he was an immigrant, when he finished, because he got arrested for stealing a bunch of cars. So you usually go to jail when you steal a bunch of cars. That's what happens. And um, he did, I think, eight years or so. So we didn't really have contact with him while he was incarcerated in the U.S. And then once he finished his time there, um, he was sent back to Trinidad and Tobago to a tropical island. So it's not that bad. But um, yeah, I got back in touch with him when I was about 18 and, and we talk all the time, almost every month. He's, you know, turned his life around and, you know, he, he's not that same person that he wasn't. So we were able to develop a really, a really close relationship because of that. And uh, yeah, he's, he's still there. I plan on visiting him at some point and going to Trinidad to visit him. And I, I talk to him all the time and, and uh, I'm so, you know, happy that he was able to, to turn things around for him. So, so thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Button is funny on my thing here. So yeah, there's about 20 accolades of great presentation. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, your mother must be very proud of what you've accomplished. Um, I think I just want to make sure I didn't forget something. Your humility will be a wonderful asset to your success. And yes, that is true. <laughs> um, I think you've answered uh, everything except for the contact information. Yeah, just send it out if anybody you know wants me to come. Marcy, to the youth or something. I'm on. Yeah, Marcy can. Um, Marcy Clark never wants any accolades either, um, but she is my right arm in all of my human services work. Can we just clap for Marcy? She hates it when we do this. <laughs> if I brought her up, she would never forgive me. So we won't do that. But um, yeah, so Marcy makes sure that all of the follow-up comes out to everyone. And so, yeah, with, with Paris's permission, then we will um, be able to share that out too. Um, it was just really an honor to have you today, Paris. Thank you all. Okay, we're getting started. If you can find your seat. I'm so sorry, because part of the joy of being together is this right here, what we do for each other. <clears throat> so for everyone online, um, you know what, just like Paris's mom, um, with everything that is horrible, uh, we can learn from it and glean from it. And this resilience symposium would have never gone with in person and online had there not be a pandemic. <laughs> been a pandemic, and it saves money for us, and we have a bigger reach. And so I, that's just another example of of something that's incredibly difficult and what good has come out of it. And so um, again, thanks. But we are super, super excited to have people in person. It's easier to present um, to an audience in person. I think it was, it was harder for presenters in the time where it was just a handful of people we could gather. Um, also, I wanted to point out that um, the last comment online was, what a great example of resiliency and um, learning about how to develop that in ourselves and in the people that we serve. So um, again, every person, every household, every organization, every community needs this. And that's why we're doing this in our fifth year. In our fifth year, we did not intend to, uh, we, we weren't intentional about asking young people. It just happened this way. Um, and I feel like it's turning out exactly as it should. Uh, we have so much that we can learn from very young people and um, those who we thought of to be here today who were suggested. So um, our next presenter is equally as inspiring, Sarah Fry. A good German name, here's how you say it. 
Frei. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> Frei. I know some German. So um, her, uh, Sarah's title is Strong Like Sarah. In July 2020, 17-year-old Sarah Fry became paralyzed from the waist down and lost both of her legs as a result of a head-on collision with a drunk driver. Happened in uh, the canyon, Sardine Canyon, right? Uh, Logan Canyon. Logan Canyon. Yeah. Sarah was hospitalized for three months and endured 20 surgeries. She was 17, remember? She has adapted to her new life and has remained strong and positive. She believes that no matter your circumstances, everyone has the ability to make the world a better and a brighter place. Please help us to welcome Sarah. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. I'm so happy to be speaking to all of you. Um, so thanks for you know taking the time and listening to what I have to say. Um, I will be sharing a little bit about me and my story and the journey that I have had um, throughout my life and some of the things that I have learned um, from my experiences. So my name is Sarah Fry. I am currently 19 years old. Um, I am at Utah State University right now studying elementary education. So I want to be an elementary school teacher, maybe to like second or third graders. <laughs> um, I love kids and I love when kids are able to understand something new, you know, because of me and it's just so rewarding. And so that's what I want to do. Um, and that's something that I've always wanted to do my whole life. And so I'm the youngest of six kids. And so I have a pretty big family. I have my parents here with me. It's their 34th anniversary today. Oh. <laughs> um, and they're just the best. I um, was raised so well and I have them to thank for that. Um, but I am going to, yeah, be sharing a little bit about my story. Um, so all my life, I've been a pretty active person and involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. Um, I was on the golf team in high school. I went to Clearfield High School um, and I've been a cheerleader my whole life as well and have done tumbling and dance um, and just have been, you know, very involved. And um, in the summer, July of 2020, I was in Bear Lake with some of my friends and we had the most fun week. We rode jet skis, um, we played in the sand, did everything that you do at Bear Lake, you know, got shakes, played in the water, and it was such a fun week, and um, we were there for a couple of days, and oh yeah, so this is, I forgot that I had slides, so this is me just kind of through high school, that's the golf team swimming, cheerleading, um, so these are some of my friends um, and who I went to Bear Lake with, um, so there's in this picture, it's me and then my friend Brooke, Tavy, and Josh. And um, they're my best friends. And so we had, you know, the best week ever. And we were coming home through the Logan Canyon. Um, and we were just, you know, talking, singing, just having a good time. It was about 8 p.m. at night on a Thursday. And Tavy was driving. And I was in the back passenger seat of the car. And we were driving along when we were hit head on by a drunk driver. I was instantly paralyzed from the waist down and had many internal injuries. I was internally bleeding and I don't remember much about the accident, um, but there was a drunk driver who was about four times over the legal limit of alcohol intoxication. And he was driving a big white truck with a four wheeler in the back and hit into Tavy's little sedan head on. Um, there were many incredible and amazing people in the surrounding cars that you know, came to help us and do whatever they could to help before the ambulance got to us. Um, but there was no cell service in the canyon. And so there was you know, no one to call 911, but luckily someone in one of the other cars had a satellite phone and was able to um, call 911 for us. 
Um, but we were all just trapped in the car, you know, screaming, crying, moaning in pain. Um, my friend Josh was sitting next to me and he was the only one that was able to get out of the car and he did what he could to help us. Um, but there wasn't much that anyone could do. We were all, we all were just trapped. And the other people in the cars who were there to, you know, try and help us, there was like a paramedic, a special forces guy, a specially trained CNA, um, a former EMT and just like incredible people that, um, were able to be around us, which was amazing. Someone had a neck brace in their car. Um, someone had a medical kit in their car. And so that was a huge blessing having those um, people try and help us. Um, but it took the ambulance about an hour to get to us. And so we were all trapped in that car for an hour. And I remember bits and pieces of being in the car. I just remember my stomach hurting so bad. Um, and the people who were, you know, kind of there to assess my injuries, my right ankle was severely broken, but I wasn't complaining about that at all. And so they kept touching my legs and saying, can you feel this? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I can or not. Um, but they figured that I was probably paralyzed. And so um, I was taken to the hospital in Logan. I was taken to um, the Logan Regional Hospital, me and Josh were, and then Tavi and Brooke were taken to the Cache Valley Hospital. And um, there I was given several blood transfusions, um, but they realized the extent of my injuries and that I would need to be life lighted to Primary Children's Hospital. So I was life lighted to primaries for more specialized care, and it was there that my parents met me. And because of COVID, only one parent was allowed to be inside the hospital at a time. And so luckily I was 17 at the time and could have a parent because if I would have been 18 years old, they wouldn't have let anyone be with me. And so my mom was able to come into the hospital and she saw me as I was being wheeled to my first surgery. And this is one of the only things that I remember for the next two weeks is seeing my mom um, and she was holding my hand and she said, everything's going to be okay. I love you and they're going to take good care of you. So I was taken into surgery um, and had to have both of my legs amputated above the knee because of the lack of blood flow that I was getting to my legs. My stomach aorta was being pinched off, which um, was the reason, and that was from the seatbelt. Um, and the seatbelt also... Um, made it so I was internally bleeding. And so the doctors also had to remove 30% of my intestines that were bleeding, which they said was just enough intestines left to be able for um, my body to function properly and um, digest food properly, which was an incredible miracle. Um, but my parents uh, spent time with me in the hospital and they switched off every other day being with me. And so every 24 hours, my parents would switch, um, and I was in the hospital for about three months. And so um, I spent the first five weeks of the hospital in the ICU, and then the next two weeks in um, just like the regular floor of the hospital, and then the next like four weeks in rehab. And so, um, like I said, I don't remember the first two weeks of the accident because I was heavily sedated and constantly in and out of surgeries. I have had, or I had 20 surgeries total. And um, I remember, you know, kind of waking up after those two weeks and I didn't know where I was. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, those two weeks kind of just, you know, felt like a dream sort of, and so my parents um, needed to tell me what had happened because I had no idea. And so my parents, um, you know, told me that I, they, the doctors had to remove my legs and I was paralyzed. And I remember the um, hospital was able to let both parents be in there to tell me what had happened. And so I had both parents by my bedside holding my hand and they told me what happened and their voices were soft 
and I remember feeling okay. I remember feeling like I was going to be okay. And this wasn't going to stop me from living my life. And I remember feeling like I will still live a life full of joy. And I just felt such peace in that moment with my parents by me. Um, I have, so that, so I left the hospital in October of 2020 and I've had, you know, many experiences that have helped shape who I am. And I have learned so many things from this whole journey of mine. And I've been able to accomplish a lot of things as well. Um, I graduated high school. So that was my senior year. Um, the accident happened like right before my senior year. And so I was able to graduate high school and, um, you know, I've been fishing with my dad and then I started college the next year. And so this is my second year of college um, and I'll graduate in spring of 2025. And so I'm really excited um, to become a teacher and um, I'm thankful for all that my journey has taught me. And I'm gonna share some of those things. The first thing that I will be talking about is about determination. And so I'm going to be sharing a story um, that happened last summer. Um, so in most of my pictures, I have like blonde hair. And so trust me, it's the same person. If you can't tell, <laughs> it's the same person, but I have like bright blonde hair in like most of these pictures. Um, so last summer, I, my family and I were planning a trip to Disney World. And we're a big Disneyland family. We go to Disneyland. Um, we would go almost every year growing up, um, but we had never been to Disney World. And uh, most of my siblings had moved out um, and have gotten married, except for me and my brother, Jake, um, who is two years older than me. And he just got married in November, but it was just us um, at the house. And so my parents um, decided to plan a little trip for us um, to go uh, to Disney World. And it was going to be my first time on an airplane since the crash. And, um, you know, first time traveling far, first time to Disney World anyways. And so um, my parents helped plan an amazing trip for us. And so um, on our agenda was to go to Magic Kingdom um, the first day and then Universal Studios the next day. And so um, the first day we got there, we got settled in. The flight was awesome. You know, we were all taken care of. And um, yeah, the flight was great and we got all settled in in Florida. And the first day we went to Magic Kingdom and it was so much fun. And I was able to, you know, ride all of the rides and um, all of the workers were so accommodating with my situation. You know, I would ask the workers, like I would say like, this is my first time doing this in a wheelchair. And so everyone was so nice and so helpful. And so I was able to ride all of the rides. And then the next day, we went to Universal Studios. And this Universal Studios isn't really associated with Disney. Um, they still have like a bunch of rides and stuff, but it's not like Disney owned. And so um, we went there and um, I go to get on my first ride, you know, just, did I, just as I did at Magic Kingdom. And we go up to get in line and there's, um, one of the seats that is on the roller coaster is like off to the side. So, you, so like little kids can test to see if they're tall enough or how you fit in the seat. So there's like a little tester seat at the front. And so we go to get in line and there's a worker and he says, hey, can I have you sit in the tester seat really quick um, just to make sure you'll be fine? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so I go and my dad um, saw to like transfer me. So he like lifted me up, put me in the tester seat. And the worker was kind of looking at me and he said, I'm so sorry, the end of your, the ends of your legs have to come to the end of the seat. And I was like, if I just scoot up just a tiny bit, then I'll be fine. And he's like, sorry, like your back has to be against the backrest and the end of your legs have to come to at least the edge of the seat. And this was like, it was like a one inch difference. And so I just kind of sat there and I was just so thrown off guard because at Magic Kingdom, I was able to just ride everything and you know everything was so accommodating. And so I didn't really know what to do. I kind of just got back in my wheelchair and I started to cry. My parents didn't really know what to say. And 
so then I was like, it's fine. I guess I want you guys to go on the ride. And they were like, no, like, we'll see well, you know, what else we can do as a family. So then we went to the next ride. And um, again, at the beginning of the ride, there was a tester seat at the front. So the worker said, hey, can I have you sit in the tester seat? So I was like, sure. So then as my dad is transferring, I like whispered in the mirror, I'm like, scoot me a little bit forward. So, so he like lifts me up and he scoots me a little bit forward so that the ends of my legs are at the edge of the seat. And the worker says, oh, I'm so sorry. You actually have to have knees in order to ride this ride. And I was like, no way. I was like, they said I did it. And they're like, every ride is different, like with their safety precautions and the you know, accommodations and everything. And so they told me that I have to have knees in order to ride the ride. And I was like, I don't, I need like a rule book for all these rides. I don't know what to expect because I keep getting thrown off guard. So then we ended up going to another ride and like we, I wouldn't go on a ride that I didn't feel like was safe for me. And, um, but I felt like I was able to do all of these, you know, if the lap bar came like across your body, um, but we went on our next ride and they didn't even have me sit in the seat. They said, oh, you have to have one real leg in order to ride this ride. And so there were just all of these like random rules and there actually was like a handbook that they gave me. And it says, I don't remember if it's, I think it said specifics of like what limbs you need in order to ride the ride. And so I just was like kind of thrown off guard. I was still able to ride some of the rides you know, Despicable Me and <laughs> the little kid ones. Um, no, but it was still really fun. And I had um, my brothers and my parents still go on some of the big kid ones because I was like, it'll make me more sad if you guys don't go on these. So they were still able to ride some of them. Um, and we were still able to have such a great day. But, you know, at the end of the day, I was kind of disappointed a little bit. I didn't, you know, expect that. Um, and then the next day, we ended up going back to Magic Kingdom again. And I was able to you know, ride all of those rides. And it just made me more appreciative of Disneyland. But um, it just was, you know, kind of a crazy trip, not really expected at Universal Studios. And so um, I came back from the trip and I was talking to someone and I was telling him my story, like the experience that I had at Disney, at Disney World. And he said, like, you probably really enjoy that thrill, huh? And I'm like, yeah, like, I love that. And he's like, you love the excitement. I'm like, yeah. And um, it was my therapist that I was talking to. So he like was getting me. And he's like, you probably love that excitement and that thrill in your life. I'm like, yeah, exactly. And he's like, I wonder if you like asked your parents to do something else that's, you know, super exciting and thrilling. I bet they would let you. And I'm like, you're right. I am the youngest. So they probably would let me. <laughs> And so um, I was kind of thinking about what I could do. Um, and he was like, you could try like zip lining or parasailing and just like saying crazy things. I'm like, you're right. Like those would be so fun. Um, but I kind of, I didn't think too much of it. I mean, that did sound super fun. Um, but the next week, um, my friend Tavy, she came to me and was like, Sarah, would you want to go skydiving with me? And I was like, I would love to go skydiving. That sounds so fun. And so I asked my parents if I could go skydiving and they of course said yes. And um, so I called the skydiving place and I told them my whole situation. I was very detailed, very descriptive so that you know I wasn't disappointed when I got there. And he's like, um, the guy on the phone was like, yeah, for sure, you can totally skydive with us. I was like, awesome. He's like, yeah, we have amputees jump all the time. He's like, some jump by themselves. He's like, do you want to be like attached to someone? I'm like, yes, of course. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we got all the details for that and then we planned a day. Um, and so it was me and my friend Tavy and Brooke um, and another girl named Cassidy. And we all went, us four girls, and we went skydiving and it was so much fun. And it was so fun to just have that thrill in my life again. And it just was so fulfilling, you know, at the end of the day. And I want to go, I want to go skydiving again. It was so much fun. And, you know, everyone there was specially trained and, you know, knew exactly what to do. And so it was just so fun. And I realized that, you know, there was something like this was holding me back from doing some of those things at Disney World but it didn't hold me back from still having fun. 
and still feeling that thrill and feeling that joy and happiness in my life. And I was still able to do something that was so exciting, even though, you know, it's completely different than Disney World, but it was still so exciting. And sometimes there are things that may hold you back from doing something and but it, you need to find different ways of, you know, doing the things that you love because sometimes it may look differently than you originally planned. And, you know, things change and life happens and you may not be in a spot right now that you thought you'd ever end up in, but you can still find joy and still do things that you love, you know, by taking that step and, um, you know, just feeling that joy and by doing things that you do love. And um, like I said, we all have um, limitations, but that also means that we all have something special about us and we all have something special to bring to the table. Um, I bet I'm the first paralyzed amputee that they've ever had jump out of an airplane, which is kind of cool. Um, but so because I am paralyzed and um, an amputee, that makes some things a little bit harder, some things easier. Um, it's something that no one has really seen before. And we have only found one girl so far in the world, she lives in Australia, who has the same type of situation as me. Um, because everyone in a wheelchair is a little bit different, you know, with the, their paralysis, you know, how high their level is, where their spine broke. Um, and so having the amputation as well is kind of unique. And so um, in physical therapy, um, the therapist wouldn't really know exactly how to do things because they mostly have um, just either just paralyzed uh, people or just amputees who can like move their you know hips. Um, and so I was trying to learn how to get from the floor to my chair. Um, so this is a video that I'm going to play in a sec, but I was trying to learn how to get from the floor of the, my chair because, so this is about, let's see, like a year and a half ago, I was getting ready to go to college. And I was like, okay, dad, what do I need to know to go to college? Like, I know how to do my laundry. I know how to cook for myself. You know, I practiced all summer doing things to try and live on my own. I had never lived on my own before and going to college is, you know, scary for anyone. And so, you know, for me, it was really, really scary because, um, I never lived on my own and for so long I was just relying on nurses and my parents and so my dad said like I don't want to scare you but what if you happen to like fall out of your chair like are you able to get back into your chair and I'm like no I can't like you're you're always here to just lift me back in and um, so I was like what if I'm by myself up at college and you know, that can be kind of scary. And so my dad and I would work on getting from the floor to my chair and we would work on it, you know, a couple of times a week or every other week or so. And it was really hard. And so I would ask some people, you know, um, some of my wheelchair friends that I have, I would ask them like, can you get to the floor of the chair? And they'd say, yeah. And I'd say, okay, how do you do it? And they would like send a video of them doing it. But like I said, they either were just paralyzed and had their legs and was able to use that kind of as um, leverage, like even though they couldn't feel their feet touching the floor, they could still lean forward and like lean on their feet, if that makes sense. Um, or they were just amputees and could like swing their hips up and just like, you know, hop around. But for me, it was it was really different. And like I said, the therapists, you know, we were all just kind of trying to figure it out together. And so um, I would ask people and they would send videos and nothing would work for me the ways that they were doing it. And so I was getting kind of frustrated because, you know, the way that seemed to work for everyone wasn't working for me. And so my dad and I would just continue to work on it. And we ended up pulling out a tumbling mat um, that I had. It's like one of those tri-fold things. And um, so we put that on to make the distance less. So we put that on the floor so that I was able to um, transfer onto the mat, which was folded in thirds. And then um, I tried a completely different way than I had ever seen. And so I faced my chair and I put my hands forward and I lifted myself straight up and then I twisted my hips where sometimes people have like one hand on the ground and one hand on the chair and get up that way. 
And so I tried it a way that I had never seen anyone and I was able to do it. And I got into my chair and I was like, I did it. And then I was like, wait, there was the mat there. Like I need to do it without the mat. But I was like, this is a good, this is a good start. And so, you know, I was able to work my way down. So then it was folded into just two thirds. And then I did it the same way. And I was able to get up into my chair and then I folded it again. And so it was just like a little, little mat that I was sitting on. And then I did it again and I got up into my chair and then I was like, okay, this is it. And this is at like 11 PM at night. I had like a burst of energy and I was like, dad, I'm getting into my chair tonight. And so then I moved the mat away and I'll just have you watch what happens. Not the importance, the significance of this one attempt is amazing. You got it, you got it, you got it. It's okay. You did it. You did it. You just went from the floor to the chair. On. Well, then I was so happy and I started crying and I hugged my dad and I was like, I did it. Now I can go to college. Like, <laughs> sign me up, I guess. Um, and so I set that goal and to get up into my chair before I left for college and I, you know, would work on it. And I had my dad keep me accountable for that. And I was able to achieve that goal eventually. And there was a time when I was up at college. Uh, most of the time I had someone around me that was able to lift me up if I ever did fall. Um, but I didn't really have an experience, um, a, until a couple months in, um, I was holding like a big blanket and I was trying to push to my car um, and part of the blanket fell on the ground and it got a little caught up in my wheels. And so um, it kind of like jolted me and then I ended up falling out just like very lightly. I ended up like landing on the blanket. It was pretty crazy. Um, and so, and then I like look around and like no one's around. I was like, good thing I know how to get up in my chair. So then I like move the blanket out of the way and I get up into my chair and I was so glad that I was able to, you know, learn that before because I had set that goal and worked really hard at it and was able to achieve it and then ended up, you know, needing that skill later on. And um, so the importance of setting goals is so great. Um, and I have seen how setting goals can really help and have helped me. Um, in the hospital, I, like I said, my parents would trade off being with each other every day. And so one day it was my dad that was there and um, I was really eager to get out of the hospital. It was like, um, I'd been there for like 60 days or something. And um, I asked my therapist, I was like, okay, what all do I need to do before I can leave the hospital? Like, I wanna get out of here. I wanna see my friends. I hadn't seen my friends in three months, which is, you know, I, I only go like maybe a day without seeing my friends. And so um, three months was a long time to go without seeing all my friends and all my family. And so I was really eager to get out of the hospital. And I was like, okay, what do I need to do? And they were like, here, let me write some things down, some you know little goals that we can make for you to achieve before you can leave the hospital. And I was like, perfect. So then my therapist wrote down some goals um, just on like a little sticky note. And I was like, this is too small. So I called my mom and I was like, mom, will you bring a big poster board and all my colorful Sharpies? <laughs> and I will make this, you know, the little teacher inside me made a goal board. Um, and so I like had my mom bring, bring to the hospital all my colorful Sharpies. I spelled some things wrong. I, yeah, don't. <laughs> Future teacher, I guess. Um, no, but. So I had my mom bring all my colorful Sharpies and I wrote down some of the goals that my therapist had for me. And um, I was like, okay, once I cross all of these off, then I can leave the hospital. And so it helped me work so hard because I wanted to leave so bad. And so I wanted, you know, it was so nice to have this visual on my hospital door. And even the nurses would walk in and they'd say, I love your goal board. Like I've never seen that before. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to make my room, my hospital room all colorful. And so it was so nice to be able to wake up and when I would roll over, I would see those every day. 
um, because I had to relearn how to do everything, like I everything. I couldn't sit up on my own. I couldn't roll over on my own. I couldn't get from the bed to my wheelchair on my own. You know, I could barely even push myself. I was, you know, connected to all the IVs and pick lines. Um, but, you know, as those slowly like got taken out, it was hard for me to like kind of push myself. And so I had to relearn how to do everything. And so this goal board was so nice to have and such a nice um, visual for me to see where I want to end up and where I need to end up. Um, and so it was, yeah, just so nice, so satisfying to cross off the X when I finally accomplished those things. And so my physical therapist would come into my hospital room and he'd say, okay, Sarah, what, what goal do you want to work on? And, um, you know, it was nice to have just that independence kind of with working on what I wanted to work on and, um, doing things that I wanted to do. Um, and I, I was able to cross off all of those things before I left the hospital. And so it was amazing. Um, and so, like I said, I wanted to leave the hospital. It was October and, um, I was a cheerleader and was a cheerleader my senior year. Um, and so when my accident happened, the cheerleaders all, you know, came together and they still got my uniform. They still got everything for me. Um, but it was my whole, uh, hospital stay was in the middle of football season. And football season is my favorite time of the year. I love, you know, watching the student section. I love being on that side of the student section, you know, as a cheerleader, like being the one hyping everyone up. Um, even though people hate us when we cheer during the play, whatever. Um, but it's so fun, you know, watching the football players, watching the student section and just being a cheerleader during the football season. And so it was October and the season's coming to an end. And I asked uh, my friend McKenna, the cheer captain, I said, when does football season end? And she said, the last game is October 14th. And at this point, it's like October 1st. And um, this is the time where I'm like, okay, like, what do I need to do to leave? And so that's when they roll the goals. And I said, I really want to leave as soon as possible, because I want to try and make it to at least one football game this year. And so they said, okay, we'll see, like, we're looking at maybe October 21st or like exactly a week later um, is when my release date might be. And I said, okay, I, I was like, is there any way that can be pushed up a week? And they're like, we'll see how well you're doing, how, all, you know, how your goals are doing, how well you're doing. And so I was like, okay, I'm getting out of here. And so I worked so hard. And I, you know, would wake up, I would have three hours of physical therapy every day. Um, and I, you know, I went from having like 30 minutes, maybe of physical therapy, just in my bed, you know, moving my arms with stretchy bands to like three hours. And so it was really intense. Um, but having those goals really helped. And I was like, I really want to leave um, in time for the football game. And so on like October 7th, like the week before, they're like, okay, Sarah, like, your mom is a nurse. She, my mom's a nurse for the NICU at Davis Hospital. And um, they're like, since your mom's a nurse and your family, like your parents are so, like we know they're gonna take such good care of you um, when you're home. We're gonna let you leave October 13th. And I was like, yes, this is perfect. I can leave the day before the football game. And so um, on October 13th, I was sent home from the hospital and it was the most incredible day ever. And the next day I was able to go out and actually cheer on the football field with all my cheerleaders. Um, they had like made a little routine for me um, that they would do at every halftime game. And so I was able to go out with them and I learned the routine from my hospital bed. And um, they put me, you know, front and center and I was able to go and perform and I was able to watch all the student section and it was just the most incredible day ever. And I was so glad that I had, you know, worked so hard in order to um, come home at the time that I wanted to. And I feel like it's because I had um, those goals and had those goals in mind and had that visualized um, that I was able to accomplish, you know, one of the things that brings me the most joy in life is you know, cheerleading. And this was just such a special day and just so incredible. Um, so there's a quote that says, if you set goals and go after them with all the determination you can muster, your gifts will take you places that will amaze you. And so I have seen that um, in my life. 
that as I, you know, have set goals and worked really hard at those, um, the gifts that I already do have will help me achieve those goals. And like I said, we all have something special to bring to the table and we're all unique and, you know, we're all different than the person sitting next to us. Um, but that means that we, you know, have something special to offer and our gifts that we have will take us places that will amaze us if we set those goals and work really hard at them. So my next point is positive mindset. So I remember um, being in the hospital um, a couple weeks in and I would go to the physical therapy gym and on my way there, you know, I'd pass the other patients that were going to and from their hospital rooms. And, um, you know, my dad would be pushing me or my mom or I would be pushing myself and I would go past um, just the other patients and the looks on their faces just seemed so sad. And I just wanted to give them all a big hug. And, you know, when I was in the therapy gym, I would um, be doing like an arm bike or something. I'd be doing an exercise and I'd look around and all of the people just seemed so sad. And it made me realize I, I don't want someone else to look at me and think that my life is miserable. I don't want them to look at me and think that I'm so sad just because I'm in a wheelchair or just because I have, you know, this thing. And so it was then that I was like, I want to show joy on my face. I want to try and be happy so that people know that I have an incredible life because I do. And I felt that I felt that deep inside that I do have an amazing life. And um, I feel like your positivity that you have that you show on your face will draw other people towards you and will attract other people. If you show it on your face, show that positivity and show that light that you already have and show those gifts that you already have. Um, I have tried just doing things that I love and doing things that bring me joy. Um, this is me at prom or one of the dances that I went to um, after the accident. Um, I still like went to the rest of my dances my senior year. And um, I just wanted to still do those things that I loved. And I wanted my friends to know that I still wanted to, you know, still be happy and be adventurous and fun. And so we would go out and we would go on adventures just like we used to. And um, I would try and make everyone else feel, you know, as comfortable as they can with my situation. And I just would try to, you know, show it on my face and just do the things that I love. And that is what brought me so much joy. Um, I remember in the hospital asking my mom, um, this was like right after I kind of found out about what happened. And my mom was there and she said, do you have any questions about anything? And I said, um, will I be able to swim again? And she's like, yeah, you will. And I said, will I be able to golf again? And she said, uh-huh. I said, will I be able to drive again? And she said, yeah, you will. And I was like, whatever, mom, you're just saying yes to all these things. Like as mom does, you know, <laughs> she's like, yeah. But I've been able to do everything that I love and everything that I wanna do. And basically everything that I used to, I drive, you know, I have hand controls, my car's parked out front. Um, and I've been able to go golfing and swimming and again, cheerleading. Um, and I don't know if you'll notice, but at the beginning, I showed some pictures and it was me golfing, swimming and cheerleading. And so um, just all of the things, you know, that I used to and that I still love doing. Um, those are the things that have brought me so much joy. Um, so I remember getting asked the question, like, um, do you feel like anything you've done has prepared you for the accident or anything in that sort of way? And I was like, I don't know. And um, then a lady in Texas, um, I remember I got like a little DM from a girl in Texas and she said, I noticed um, the things in your room. So on, on my Instagram, um, I have a little Instagram that my parents made for me after the accident. And my room was in the basement. And my parents posted pictures of what my room looked like because then they had to move my room upstairs. And so they posted pictures of what my room looked like um, on Instagram. And I remember getting a DM 
And someone was like, I noticed all of these things in your room are so just like positive and uplifting. I would have quotes on my walls and I would have things on my mirror. I would have, um, yeah, just stuff all over my room. And I was like, I guess I didn't realize like, you know, I'd put these quotes up on my walls and those are the things that I would look at every day. And so on my mirror, I had these self-affirmations. Um, I remember this was an assignment in cheer. We all got on the gym floor and she handed out pieces of paper and she said, okay, I want you to write, I am statements. So I want you to write, I am, and then whatever you think you are or whatever you want to be. And so I was like, okay. And so um, I wrote, I am strong. I have self-confidence. I am good enough. I am not needing anyone's approval. I'm excited to show my parents my improvement. And I would just write these, I wrote those things down on chair and then I ended up, you know, not throwing it away like most people probably did. I just put it on my mirror. And so those, that is what I would see every day when I would wake up and every day when I would get ready. And um, this lady, you know, she took a screenshot of this and was like, this is what's on your mirror. This is the things that have been on your walls your whole life. I've lived in the same house my whole life. And um, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that this is what I would wake up to every day. And I feel like it made such a difference with my self-confidence, my self-esteem, because I am still just as confident as I was before. And I feel like it's because of these things that I was reminded of and would wake up to. And um, so I just, I don't know, I would encourage you maybe to write self-affirmations, put them on your mirror. I, I have like a, if you have a dry erase marker, you can write stuff on your mirror and then it erases and it's just fine. I've done that um, for a while and like all my life basically. And so um, just like putting things up, little reminders, and you may not think it's going to make that big of a difference, but I feel like it really made a difference for me. And that's been um, just incredible to see. Um, so it's, it's easy for me to say, you know, just be positive. And a lot of people have asked me, um, like how I have been so positive and I never have a really specific answer. Um, I wish I had the secret to happiness. Um, because for some people, it's just not that easy. It's, you know, it may not come naturally to just be positive. And it's hard sometimes to just be happy and just put a smile on your face. I know that it can be so hard sometimes. Um, so the closest thing that I've found to the secret of happiness kind of is to live in the now. So um, I learned something a couple months ago and someone said this to me. They said, if you are mad or sad about a situation, you might be living in the past. And if you might be anxious and stressed about a situation, then you may be living in the future. But if you live in the now, then you will find peace and feel peace and joy. Um, this is a quote that says, if you want to live an amazing life, a truly abundant, happy life, make it a priority to live more in the present moment. Um, so when I was 15 years old, um, I would get a ride from my brother, Jake, who was 17 at the time. I would get a ride from, to and from school every day. And um, one time we were in the car and uh, he had to go straight to work right after school, but he had to go and take me home first. And so I was like, sorry, I'm going to make you late. Like, if you're going to be late, he's like, no, we'll be fine. And so we went out to the parking lot and, you know, the after school traffic is just crazy, you know, especially in high school. And so the traffic was crazy and there was just all this traffic. And I was getting so frustrated. I was like, this is so annoying. Like, you're going to be late for work. And this is so dumb, like any way we go, like whether we turn right or left, it's just going to be traffic and we're not moving. And I just was like slamming the dashboard and I was getting so mad. And he looked at me and he's like, Sarah, there's nothing we can do about this traffic. Like I'm going as fast as I can. And so is the car in front of me. And so is the car in front of them. And so you might as well be happy about it. Like you might as well make the most of it. Like we can sit here and listen to music. We can listen to our favorite songs on repeat. We can talk to each other. Like 
you know, we can make the most of this car ride because I'm going as fast as I can. And like you said, whatever way we go, there's gonna be traffic. And so I'm going as fast as I can. And I was like, you're right. Like I had this shift in my mindset that kind of set me up for high school. I was a sophomore at the time. And that kind of changed my whole mindset and perspective for high school and the rest of my life. Is that there was nothing that we could have done to control that moment. And so we can just make the most of it. And we can talk to each other or listen to music and just live in that moment because you know, we couldn't control what was going on around us. And that was just, yeah, like I said, it just ch changed my mindset because sometimes in life, there's things that you can't control that you have no control over. And so, you know, you might as well be happy about it. You can't be mad or sad about it because that you can't control that. And so living in the now has really helped me and has really, you know, shifted that mindset for me. Um, this quote says, you have power over your mind, not outside of it. Realize this and you will find strength. And so this quote is um, very important and impactful um, because, you know, for me, I like for me in my situation, it's like what's done is done. I can't go back and change the past. And so I can't say, what if this would have happened? What if we would have taken a different way that day coming home from Bear Lake? What if this, what if that? You know, that'll just create um, these barriers in my mind and not allow me to move forward. And so living in the now and feeling that acceptance has really helped me. Um, I've been able to, you know, still, like I said, just like live in the moment, live in the moment with my friends and hug everyone I want to and, you know, still have dance parties. That's at my brother's wedding, having a dance party. And I've surrounded myself with people who make me feel joy and who allow me to live in the moment and live in the now. Um, this quote, um, it says, accept. When you accept the reality of who you are and your current circumstances, you free up space to focus on what you want to attract in your life. We can't change the past, but we can choose to take full ownership over the present moment. And so that's kind of what I've been saying. Like, I can't go back and change the past, but I can change who I surround myself with and what I surround and what I surround myself with. And, um, you know, these things that help me live in the present moment. Um, so these are some of the things that I have learned from my journey and I wouldn't change my experiences for the world. Um, I've learned so much and met so many incredible people and am so grateful and lucky for these experiences that I've had and this whole journey that I have been on. Um, and so if you stay determined and focus on a positive mindset and live in the now, you too can live a joyful life. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much. She hit her, her learning objectives as well. Um, really inspiring. I must be learning a little more control because I feel like my eyes are watering right now, but they're not so obvious to all of you. <laughs> um, so we, it's 1051 and we have just a few minutes for questions. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you some of the stuff that's come up on the chat during all of the speakers really amazing chat conversations and kind of wows and appreciation for each of you. Um, thank you for sharing this difficult experience and for your amazing resilience. I'm so excited for the students that will be taught by Ms. Fry. They are going to have such a unique education above and beyond and think about that, they will. This will be amazing. They will be amazing students through your experience. Um, what an amazing person you are. I wish you could talk to my daughter. <laughs> so much strength and courage. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. More of them. An example of resilience, hard work, optimism, positive energy. And this is so cute. So I wanted to review the chat a little bit. Are you sure you don't want to work in mental health? <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach my students. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. Is there anyone who has a question in the room? 
seen any questions pop up on it. Yes, in the back. Yeah, that's a great question. Did you, growing up, were your parents kind of obvious goal setters or where did that all come from in you? Um, that's a really good question. I feel like I never was one to be, you know, I've never been organized. I've never felt that satisfaction from crossing things off my off list like a lot of people are. Um, so I feel like I wasn't like that before very much. Um, but that's something that I feel like I learned and found more of an appreciation of after the accident. Um, my parents are definitely like that. My dad is all about goals. He could probably talk about that for an hour. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I feel like, yeah, maybe, maybe just being around my dad all the time in the hospital. <laughs> um, but setting goals, like, I, I feel like I wasn't like that before. But after, um, I found to really like that. Yeah, I am a bucket list person. Um, I've always had like a lifelong bucket list and um, I made like a little new and improved bucket list after this. Um, so kind of like bucket list and like kind of like goals just like in the future, but not necessarily like little goals. But now I am like that and it has really helped. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Sarah. I, I My only question is, like, what's your Instagram? Because I bet you interact with people there and people might have questions or things that can find you that way. Is that a yeah. good thing to share? Yeah. So my Instagram is strong dot like dot Sarah. So strong like Sarah is like the little catch phrase thing that my family came up with uh, for me. And then on Facebook, it's just Sarah Fry. So yeah. We can find you and interact that way and reach out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? Go Aggies. That's one of my three. <laughs> my daughter <laughs> played volleyball and she's, she's a strong one too. <laughs> she played for them. So you're going to have a great experience. You're already teaching so many, including all of us. So Sarah, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Okay. Big claps. And then as we said before, um, this all started right before I became a County commissioner sworn in in January of 2019, this concept of having a Davis County Community Resilience Symposium every single year. And um, we work really hard to get great speakers every single year. Um, in year one, someone knew about Gabriella. <laughs> and um, she was so powerful and so amazing in January of 2019. I still remember some of the things that she taught to be trauma informed as individuals and organizations and the, the power and the expertise that she has. And we were very intentional about inviting her back um, for the year five celebration. So I'll give her background and then we'll let her get going. Gabriella Grant, MA, her title is Open Eyes, Open Hearts, Open Minds, Keys to Trauma-Informed Resilience. Gabriella Grant, MA, is the director of the California Center of Excellence for Trauma-Informed Care in Santa Cruz, California, overseeing the center's research and policy analysis activities. In addition, she convenes the Santa Cruz Trauma Consortium and the annual fall trauma conference. I bet that's a good one. Oh. Through Gabriella Grant Consulting Incorporated, Ms. Grant consults with publicly funded agencies and trains professionals in the social services topics that cover trauma, substance use, PTSD, eating disorders, domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. That's a lot. As a, tr a trained policy analyst, Ms. Grant applies the public health model to understanding the neurobiological effects of trauma, safety, and coping. She helps agencies use trauma-informed practices to create a therapeutically beneficial milieu for a variety of treatment modalities and outcomes. Her focus on effective programming and enhancing safe policies and procedures for staff 
has provided a strong public health foundation to agencies in, this is my list right here, healthcare, human services, criminal and juvenile justice, housing and mental health treatment. Please give a warm welcome to Gabriella Grant. Kindness abounds in Davis County. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody on this Friday, our last Friday of January, 2023. I really appreciate you and inviting me and my dog <laughs> to your conference. Um, she's a good girl. There she is right there. So what powerful stories we heard this morning. Um, you know, I'm almost like, wow, should I like throw my slides aside and do my own personal story, but no, I'm gonna grip onto my slides. I'm gonna grip onto them with life. Um, but hopefully we're gonna see today that there is a connection between what I'm about to say and what Paris and, um, and what Sarah talked about in their own personal experiences. So, you know, here's me, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not on Instagram, but connect with me via LinkedIn if you'd like to. We also have a great website, Trauma Informed California with those dashes. So um, feel free to check us out. We've got a lot of great information. We spent most of the pandemic trying to make sure the materials become much more available rather than, you know, exact, ex for example, through me. All right, we do have those learning objectives and I'm gonna hit them. I am going to hit those objectives. No, I don't, I have this thing right here. Oh, do I have to get it? Okay, closer, closer, closer. I am emotional. Those two stories really kind of touched me very deeply. So um, I really acknowledge the fact that I'm a little more emotional than I usually am. Um, we've got a quick 50 minutes, uh, 30, 47 minutes, um, and I will make use of this time. There is handouts. There are handouts connected to today's training. If you look in your material, you're actually going to find one that I'm going to go over with a little bit of in-depth um, focus. So look through your materials, see if you can find this as a single handout. Um, it's just going to be easier for everybody to read. And it looks like it's on the back of one of the single sheets. Yes, it is. It's on the back of my bio. Okay, so let's get started. Books, minds, and umbrellas only work if they're open. So have you ever noticed though, sometimes it's hard to open up that book. It's hard to open up that mind. And sometimes, even today, you might've said, I don't need that umbrella, I'm gonna leave it in the car. It's hard to open up that umbrella. So what I'm gonna show you today is that there's actually a sequence that our mind would like us to operate in. And if we use this sequence, we're gonna be able to open our minds um, a lot more frequently and under maybe even more difficult circumstances. All right, so I'm gonna call this the neurosequential keys to professional resilience. We can throw out the word professional. These are the neurosequential keys to resist resilience uh, for everybody. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is safety and that our bodies require safety in order to operate. I can't open up my mind unless I'm safe. If I do, I often come up with decisions or plans or goals that are on the basis of my lack of safety. And those, that, those decisions then lead me towards more safety, unsafety, and more unsafety, and more unsafety. So we're gonna focus first on safety, your safety, your safe connections, your safe boundaries, safe self-care, safe finances, rest, sleep, and needed treatment. We're gonna see that if we're not giving ourselves these safety keys, that next step, those open hearts, are not gonna be as easy to open up. I'm wondering if there's anything on this list that you notice, hey, I'm not as safe as I would like to be in this area. Just think it to yourself. We'll get there in a minute. Open hearts. I'm in Utah. This is an open-hearted community. I'm from California. Not so much. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you'd think that California is all open-hearted and everything. Not really. I would say 
compared to Utah, California is hard hearted. But even compared to, you know, my experiences around the world internationally in Canada, um, that California can, has a harshness to it, a hardness to it in its heart. And it's got a lot of, you know, freedoms. You can do whatever you want, you know, anything you want really, but don't get in trouble. Don't get addicted. Don't slip. Don't fail. Because as soon as you do any of these things in California, nobody almost nobody is there for you. So I'm usually in California trying to help agencies start to see that actually opening up your heart is a way uh, to do work. So let's look at this open heart. Once safe, once safe, then we can start to match our values to the work that we do. Why did you come into this field? What is the value that leads you to this work? Also, especially within trauma-informed services, we must acknowledge the existence of suffering, including disasters. It's a part of the human experience. It can't be avoided, but it can be made less common, less intense, and less unsafe. And let's see if we can do those things. With an open heart, we can foster altruism and service. Um, we can also, also engage in social activism once safe, I'm able to see what is needed. But when I'm unsafe myself, I often project my needs on to others. And then we can tap into spirituality and higher purpose um, to, to, to tap in so that we can get through those difficult times, through those murky waters. Once our eyes are open, our safety is within us. Once our hearts are open and we can see connection to others, then we can open our minds. Cultivate a learning mind, learning new things, maybe today. Integrate this new information into your work. I often hear my trainees say, well, Gabby, I always do this. And I'm like, okay, well, let's do that instead. You know, <laughs> if we're always doing this thing, then let's do this instead. Let's get a new skill going. It's so exciting. Once we have open eyes, open mind, open, open hearts, open minds, then we can question old beliefs that we're not worthy, that nobody loves us, that it doesn't matter. All of these things we might've learned during unsafety. Once we have open eyes, open hearts and open minds, then we can actually enjoy people's perspectives, differences and approaches. There's not just one way to do things, not even safety. There's a multitude, an infinite way to do things. Uh, it's so exciting. But when we're not safe, when our hearts are closed, and especially when our minds are closed, we often are, feel threatened and maybe even abused by other people's perspectives. And this whole process, which is the neurosequential model, I'm about to break it down here, uh, allows us to think optimistically, at least occasionally. You know, as there is bad, there is good. As there is down, there is up. As there is tragedy, there is also uh, the coming back together and healing. So notice, where are you in this? Is it open eyes? I think a lot of clinicians, a lot of professionals often have open hearts but their eyes might not be open to what is truly safe and truly unsafe. This is an area of great learning for many of us. Is your, is your mind open, but your heart is restricted, right? Um, what area of this model is of greatest benefit to you? You can decide. So what I'm talking about here with this open eyes, open heart, open minds thing is the neurosequential model of therapeutics by Dr. Bruce Perry. Who here is already familiar with the neurosequential model of Dr. Bruce Perry? Okay, it's an excellent model. You can get certified in it, feel free. Uh, he's a very interesting guy. He just wrote a book with Oprah. What happened to you? Is that the name of the book? What happened to you uh, with Oprah? So people might've heard about that one. The neurosequential model of therapeutics is not a specific technique. It's not like EMDR or DBT or even seeking safety if you're familiar with these techniques. 
It instead is, it is a developmentally sensitive, neurobiologically informed approach to clinical work. And here I'm gonna define as clinical is you working with any other human being, including yourself. It is not a specific therapeutic technique or intervention. It's a structural framework around which you will then design whatever you do, third grade classroom, uh, EMDR, um, training a dog, you know, whatever it is, when you have this knowledge, then you can start to see, am I working neurosequentially or the opposite? Am I working against the nervous system, against how the body operates? So this is a bottom up approach. The idea, according to Bruce Perry, is to start with the deepest in the brain, undeveloped or abnormally functioning set of problems, and then moving sequentially up the brain as improvements are seen. So we're gonna start bottom up. So we're gonna start at the bottom of this next slide right here, at the bottom. Brain stem, brain stem stimulation. So at the very base of our brain, we have, here I've got a little diagram, I'll get to it first. We've got the basal ganglia, the reptilian structure that is primarily focused on keeping you alive non-consciously, autonomically, automatically, but also to a certain degree consciously. So you can consciously move your hand away from that fire, or you can consciously see that there's an exit, um, you know, in the smoke or whatever it is. So at that bottom part of the brain, it is focused on you, on you, on yourself, self-regulation, self-protection, self-direction, five senses, motor muscles, action, rhythm, routine, attention to the environment. And the only sound that this part of the brain can produce is a protective utterance, stay away, like a hiss or the shaking of a rattlesnake, right? Stay away, stay away, stay away. That's the only communication that this brain, this part of the brain wants to communicate, stay away from me. Once this part of the brain, here, we'll go back to Bruce Perry's work. So. He says that if an individual is in a fear state that is persistent, then we want to address that part of the brain first. And uh, this is through brainstem stimulation. Dance, music, massage, especially for children whose persisting fear state is so overwhelming. So their brainstem becomes regulated by safe, predictable, repetitive sensory input. Um, Bruce Perry calls this patterned repetitive somatosensory um, activation. Patterned repetitive somatosensory activation. Just call out what's a regular old activity that we do that is a patterned repetitive somatosensory activity. Walk my dog. Walk with or without a dog because we tend to be pretty rhythmic. What's another activity? Patterned, repetitive, somatosensory activity, TikTok, kind of. I'm going to give that a 50% right there. I'm giving that 50% <laughs> Or social me medium. People might view social me media that way, right? I don't they know. They can do. They can yeah. do. If I think the 50% more that I'd want to see in the TikTok example is that there's some sort of physical activity going on, yeah. not just like a captive state of awareness. Yeah, in the back. Okay, sure, duck, duck, goose. But keep, it, keep in mind that this word here is self. Self. This might be highly empath empathic people. This might be a big uh, uh, aha or uh, oh moment. Can I speak? Can I speak? This might be a big aha moment, which is self comes before others. Who here was raised to believe or to behave differently? Others come before self. Anybody? Yeah. That is not neurosequential. That is, that is cultural, uh, often gendered, generational, power imbalance driven children to adult driven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is not how the neurobiology operates. What about online? They're saying eating, sleeping, brushing teeth. Okay, eating can be um, patterned and repetitive, absolutely. 
and definitely brushing your teeth. I think we all do it in exactly the same way. Yeah, singing, singing. It's patterned, it's repetitive. And the more you do it, the more patterned and repetitive and actually good sounding it becomes. Fantastic. Has anybody noticed like my voice is a little bit not regulated? So what I'm gonna ask everyone to do along with me is a small regulatory activity. And let's see if it changes my voice. So everybody notice how you're feeling right now. Maybe your, your spine in that seat, pressing up against that backrest. Let's notice our shoulders. Let's, let's bring our shoulders up to our ears. Everybody online, voluntarily, of course, bringing it in, squeezing hard and breathing in. And let's drop these shoulders off. And forward. Good. Now have a look outside a window. Notice what you see out this window. Name some objects to yourself silently. What are the colors that you see, the objects? Good. Now pick up an object, any object that's nearby, totally voluntary. Notice this object, how much does it weigh? What is it made out of? If it's edible, does it have a taste? Does it have an odor? Notice everything you can about this object. As you put that object down, extend your arms out in front, squeeze these hands into fists, squeeze really hard, now breathe in and shake out those fists. One more time, out, squeeze, breathe in and shake. All right, now we're gonna do our test. How is my voice now? A little bit better? I mean, I feel it better. So you tell me. All right, so we've got that brainstem stimulation. What's the key word for this first part of the brain according to the neurosequential model? What's the key word we're gonna remember? Self, self-determination, self-confidence. We're gonna need others, there's other parts of the brain, but that core, most internal part of your own brain and nervous system is for you. Once regulated, Bruce Perry says we can go up into the middle part of the brain, which is the limbic system or the mammalian brain. Empaths, this is where you love to be. This is the positive, nurturing, predictable interactions with safe peers, teachers, and caregivers to bond with others via increased positive relationships or therapeutic relationships. We got there. But what did we need first? Before we can get interpersonal or social, what do we need first? Safety in ourselves, for ourselves, within ourselves. Safety first, social, voluntary. Safety is an essential part of human functioning. Socialization is a voluntary function. Who here was raised in an environment that said that you have to be nice? You have to be polite. You have to do for others. You have to consider others definitely before yourself. So that's cultural, that's cultural, but that's not neurobiological. And many of us have probably been in situations where it's like, is it me or is it everybody else? Am I supposed to be working for, you know, is it me or is it everybody else? Does anybody here know somebody who actually gave up themselves for others? Yes, yes. And the opposite, does anybody know somebody who desperately held on to themselves and had to reject everybody else in order to do so? Yes, yes. So we can really see that culture, gender, history, the environment around us can, can get in the way of us understanding ourselves, being safe to ourselves and unto ourselves. So safety, then social. But it doesn't stop there, folks. Once we are able to interpersonally relate with other people in a safe way, boom, our mind is available to us. Our body says, we've got some extra, extra bucks in the bank. Let's spend it on an open mind. And that's where Bruce Perry says we get into a cortical intervention where we then plan into the future, budget into the future, invest into the future, as well as our core areas of language, narration, time sequentiality, in order to understand meaning or purpose 
within the world. So we've got neurosequentially these three, you know, architecturally distinct, evolutionarily distinct areas of the brain. And what I'm going to ask you is to start to assess your own treatment, especially if you come from a gender, a culture, an environment that says top down. I'm wondering, is American culture a top down style of culture? Or are we a hierarchical style of culture? I mean, I think so. I mean, I think so. You can have your own opinion, but I think so. Um, what about school? Is that top down? Oh yeah, principal and everybody else. What about the military? We talked about the military. Is that hierarchical? My husband says, why do you ask me questions when you know the answer? <laughs> <laughs> so we, most of us have been operating, families, are families hierarchical? Yes, yes. So most of us, and as a matter of fact, our thinking brain is right here at the top. So it seems to make sense. We're top down functioners, but it turns out we're actually bottom up functioners. And so for us to see, are we doing a top down treatment with our clients? especially highly traumatized clients? And can we flip it and become a bottom-up treatment provider? Bruce Perry, of course, can help you do that um, more than I will be able to today. So a trauma-informed approach is not really even a therapy or a technique. It is not intended to diagnose trauma or treat even trauma-related conditions. Instead, trauma-informed care is a universal precautionary approach that treats everybody, everyone who has survived. If we're alive, we've survived. We are all survivors, as if they might have the adverse effects from a tra traumatic events that are both known and unknown, but may be affecting survivors and responders either way. So what we're doing here is we're saying, I know some things about my client. As a matter of fact, I know some things about myself, but I also don't know some things about my client. And as a matter of fact, there are even some things I don't know about myself. So what we're doing is we're creating an environment that is able to create safety, even when we do not have any direct information, or maybe we have false information and we can work safely nonetheless. So let's get into that handout. Can I have a, um, yeah, the big copy because it's super small for me too. I think I made the big copy for myself. To draw your yes, there it is, great. All right, so we're gonna make some trauma-informed shifts. It's up here, uh, hopefully people can, can read this. So when I say traditional, I'm really talking about traditional trauma treatment, right? but I'm talking about traditional services as well. So in the traditional model of services, trauma is often seen as a past event, but we know it still affects people today. So it's not only a past event, it's also a present event. And it's what is going on in the present that the person has the ability to do something about. I think Sarah discussed that very, very, um, um, fully, really. So in trauma-informed, we are present-focused. We do not go back into the past in order to stir up graphic, often painful, traumatic, jagged memories until the person is what? Safe. Able to connect with others safely. Able to give consent, which is cortical, able to give consent in order to do past-focused treatment. So do we slide or glide into a trauma story and trauma-informed approaches? We do not. Do we think in trauma-informed approaches that getting the person to tell us their trauma story is going to be the big change and everything's going to be, you know, hunky-dory after that? We do not. As a matter of fact, in a trauma-informed approach, we protect the client from getting into any graphic details that they might not be safe around. That is the trauma-informed approach. In the traditional model, trauma was an expertise. Who, who, who came up scholastically where trauma was an expertise? You had to choose it. 
get involved with it. Um, I know there's some people who are my age, so I know that you came up during that period of time. You know, oh no, I do positive psychology. No trauma at all, right? Oh, there's those trauma specialists over there. You know, they're kind of, they smoke cigarettes, you know? Here in the trauma-informed approach, every single one of the staff are trained. Bus drivers are trained. Cafeteria workers are trained. Swing shift workers are trained. Everybody's trained. It's not like, oh, we're gonna wait until Dr. So-and-so comes in because she knows trauma. Meanwhile, everybody is, you know, um, you know, inadvertently unsafe around this client while we're waiting for so-and-so. The focus on trauma treatment has been verbal, that you have to verbally disclose, this happened to me. And then I have to verbally say, it wasn't your fault. And then we go back and back verbally until something amazing happens. Only has anybody noticed that there's some trauma survivors that will not tell you what happened? They won't do it. As a matter of fact, there are some trauma survivors who can't do it. They don't know their own trauma story. To a certain degree, I don't know mine. So we're not making people do things they can't do in trauma-informed. We're building up the skills so that they can do, and then they can choose to do what they wanna do. Not me telling you, you need to tell your trauma story. No, you don't, but you can when safe. So in trauma-informed, we're, vo we're focusing on behavioral disclosures. I do Seeking Safety and uh, it's in a group format. You don't have to come in on time. You don't have to stay, you don't have to participate. So then I can start to measure. Oh, client came in late, looked like they couldn't care less, left early. Same client comes a little earlier, looks a little less, leaves a little less early. Over time, I start to see same client coming in on time, active, not only staying the whole time, staying after, right? That was the healing of the nervous system of this individual based on what they needed and the amount of time that's needed. That's obviously not what clients often are allowed to do. Who here has a program where clients are consequenced if they come in late to treatment? Okay, you can wiggle your eyebrows at me if you don't want anybody to know. But most programs do. Most programs do. And what about leaving early? Are clients allowed to do that? You know, kind of give me this face if you're like, no, clients can't, they can't leave early. They have to stay the whole time or else, or else a consequence, a consequence. And that's the first time they come. We don't even give folks that opportunity to start to dose into what's going on. Why would a trauma survivor need time to dose into what's going on. Always the correct answer. And it's from the inside that safety is produced. It is outside that the signals of whether this person feels safe is going to be safe, but it's from the inside. In a trauma-informed approach, I mean, in a traditional approach, we look at the client in isolation from his or her surroundings, upbringings, and opportunities. It's like, you should never do drugs, no matter what, even though there's drugs all the way around you, right? You should never be angry, no matter what, even though there's a lot of CRAP all around you, right? So instead, what we're going to say is in a trauma-informed program, we emphasize reconnecting the client to their own future by, oh, sorry, I read the wrong one. Uh, I need the big print. Connection to environmental, social, and familial context. People's behaviors were developed within an environment, within a family, within a community. And those behaviors made sense within that community, within that family, within that environment. So if I take, rip that person out of their community, their environment, their family, put them in there, and then say, don't do that. Well, I'm, I'm not trauma-informed, but I'm also going to... Um, reduce the chances that this individual will even benefit from this interesting treatment that you've subjected them to. In a traditional model, the emphasis is on constraining and constricting the client to protect the client from the client or the client from everybody else. 
you need to stop doing drugs because that is going to be bad for other people right? You need to not be angry. You need to, you need to stop doing this. Instead, in the trauma-informed um, organization, we emphasize reconnecting the client. Wait, <laughs> I need to use this big print. <laughs> yeah, we need to reconnect the client to their own future by building skills for self-regulation. So in a trauma-informed program, it's what you can do, not what you can't do. You can come in for even three minutes of treatment. That's what you can do. I didn't come at all. Well, you could have come for even three minutes, but you didn't come at all. So now there's something going on rather than, oh, you can only come in 15 minutes late. Well, I was more than 15 minutes late. So actually it's kind of like a shared responsibility there. What we're gonna do in a trauma-informed organization is build skills of safety. And then with those safety skills, this individual is going to decide how social they want to be, how goal-oriented they want to be, whatever, how rich they want to be, how married they want to be. They can decide all of these things for themselves. But without safety, what is that marriage? What is that career? What is that money? Does anybody here know somebody who got really rich but was not safe? Tons. If you're not safe, money is actually one of the most dangerous things that you can have. Because then think of all the things that you can do to yourself at that point. And yet we're afraid of youth, right? It is actually adults with money that are actually much more dangerous, especially to themselves. In the traditional model, we see the diagnosis and the treatment as the goal of mental health. But in a trauma-informed organization, we are going to see trauma broadly within all safety-related issues like mental health, substance abuse, criminal behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as a matter of fact, becoming a third grade teacher might be the most trauma-informed thing to do because we can start to influence safety at that level, at that level. In the traditional model, it's often adversarial. I can't get this client to engage. This client isn't doing what they're supposed to. If the client does, then we're like, okay, good client. Let me focus on the client that's not doing what they should be doing, right? Do you see how adversarial even mental health is, let alone criminal justice or child protective or other kind of programs? Instead, we're gonna have a collaborative process working together with shared values. And here is one shared value that almost all human beings have, to be safe. So that's our biggest connector right there. Not everybody values honesty. Not everyone values hard work. Not everyone values, I don't know, marriage. But all of those people I just mentioned who didn't value that stuff, they value safety. So it's gonna be safety where we're gonna be able to work most with most people. Believe it or not, even within mental health and possibly even within Utah, you let me know, the client is often perceived as dangerous and their safety or their needs are seen as at odds with everybody else's safety and needs. And we must control them and get them under control before we let them loose in society. Here, here what we're doing is we're saying that the client can be safer and we're going to promote public safety, everybody's safety, by promoting client safety. When I'm safer, you're safer. And I'll tell you this, when I'm unsafe, you better believe you're unsafe, right? So the safer I become, the safer you become. But here's what I'm not saying. You need to become safe for your children. You need to become safe for yourself and your children will benefit from your safety. Is that a different message to parents? I think a lot of child abandonment is actually due to the fact that parents fundamentally do not think they can be safe around their own children, and it is therefore better to abandon them. You need to stop doing drugs for your children. Can't stop doing drugs, so I might as well abandon them because all I can do is drugs. But we set that logic up. Finally, in the traditional model, whether it's trauma recovery, 
or criminal justice, it's always a zero sum game in the traditional model, which is what the client needs is in conflict with what society needs. And instead, what we're gonna say is that safety can be increased all the way around with everybody all the time, no matter what. And even if there's just a little bit of change, it's, it's a big payoff because it's safer. That's a lot of information in one little handout. And Deb, did I not reduce this handout? It used to be so long, it was like a three hour lecture. That's enough, right? That was already enough of those, of those trauma informed. Yeah, I, thank you for giving me mine back so I can study it. <laughs> I just threw it to the floor. Um, so there, it's, it, there, there's more than that, but that's already enough for us to do, right? To make these, these changes. What on this list, mark it. What on this list would you like to focus more on? What, what is a meaningful shift for you, personally, professionally? I've got a few more slides and for whatever reason, I feel compelled to go over them all. So I'm going to. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shift gears right here and really talk about ourselves, you know, yourself. I'm gonna to talk to you as a human being who is also a professional. So if safer mother, safer child, if that logic holds, safer clinician, safer client, Safer clinician, safer client? Yes. I'm going to make that argument that the more you focus yourself on your own safety, the more your clients benefit. But who knows clinicians who focus on their, chi on their child, on their client's safety and ignore their own? Anybody know a clinician like that? Look like this if it's you. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So now I'm talking to you. And what I'm going to say is that you deserve safety. And I'm going to give you some helpful hints on how to be safer. I've got a big piece of news. Blind trust is dangerous. Who here was raised in a culture that said, trust your mother, father, sister, brother, trust people, trust good people, trust, trust. You need to trust. She can't trust. Do you see how much value we put on trust? You just determine for yourself how much value you put on trust. So we often send children <laughs> messages that trust is a good thing, that they should trust people. But we all know as parents that, uh-oh, that's dangerous. It is dangerous, but it's dangerous for adults too. Blind trust is dangerous. That desire within many trauma survivors to say, aha, I found somebody I can trust. This person I can trust. And they blindly trust. But then this person shifts and goes from being great to being awful, to being abusive, to being exploitative. But I trust them. Can you see how the trauma survivor is now almost unable to disconnect at this point? that trust instead of being an opportunity for connection, instead is entrapment and maybe even imprisonment. Does anybody know someone who's been imprisoned by somebody they trust? So blind trust is dangerous. And we're gonna learn that the safer I am, the more I can see who I can and cannot trust. So for our purposes today, what I'm going to say is um, let's eliminate aversive practices uh, with yourself, first of all, <laughs> and then with our clients. What is an aversive practice? An aversive practice is the combination of a faulty belief system combined with a lack of training that then leaves staff or individuals, but leaves staff in a lurch. How am I supposed to handle this situation? As a matter of fact, the faulty beliefs plus lack of training equal adverse practices reminds me a lot of the programs here in Utah that were dealing with troubled youth. Maybe some right here in Davis County, definitely in canyons around here, right? So, um, you know, what was happening there? They were hiring folks, paying them not very much. These folks came in with their own culture, their own gender, their own family, their own experiences, their own trauma as staff. 
their own belief system. And then they weren't trained to work with kids who had trauma. They were told they were supposed to, what? What were those troubled teen programs? Past focus, experts, verbal disclosure, looking at client in isolation, emphasis on constraining, separation from the community, seeing diagnosis as essential, adversarial process, client is dangerous, zero sum game. I just, I just, I just analyzed almost all of the troubled teen industry right there. Plus lack of training. You know, sometimes I do these trauma-informed trainings and it's only clinicians like licensed mental health professionals that are sent to these trainings. What about the night staff? What about the transportation staff? Or with that troubled teen industry, what about those ones that do the kidnapping, right? Um, you know, they also need training. So if an agency sends me some of their staff, but not all of their staff, that tells me they're not trauma informed. I want to see the CEO and I want to see the swing shift person um, because everybody is going to be a part of this process. Adverse practices of any kind are a failure of a treatment plan, not an actual plan or client treatment failure. But that's true for yourself. I'm wondering if many of us are, 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 are doing adversive practices on ourselves that with a faulty belief system about who we are and what we can do, combined with a lack of information, we're abusing ourselves. We're adversive to ourselves. Um, and I'm wondering if we can commit to eliminating all forms of seclusion and restraint, not only within our programs, unless absolute physical safety is required, right? But also with ourselves. I'm wondering how many trauma survivors try restriction and seclusion and restraint as their primary made mode of, of recovery. A lot, a lot. And when, within our programs, within ourselves, let's examine historical, cultural, cultural and gendered messages that are not safe. So I'm not asking you to like, just get rid of any of these things. I'm asking you to examine them and to see what is safe and embrace that and to notice what is unsafe and to protect yourself from that part. You can be safe before, during, and after a crisis, a difficulty, a challenge. Before, we heard it from Sarah, she was already in a before stage before her accident with her positive affirmations and her ways of doing things. She had some before going on. But a lot of people think, oh, you know something, I don't have to plan because I'm just going to handle it. A lot of trauma survivors think that. As a matter of fact, it's a faulty belief. A lot of trauma survivors think because I've already been abused, I can identify abuse and avoid it. When in fact, what the research says is that if you've been abused once, you are at extremely high risk of being abused again because it's not being recognized. It hasn't been acknowledged. So I'm gonna focus on before, but guess what? You can be safe during an unsafe behavior. You can find safety within a crisis. I'm gonna show you some pointers for that too. And after, this is another area. People often think after it's done, you know? I'm just gonna pretend like it never happens. But after we need care as well. So thinking ahead is the opposite of impulsivity. Think of a situation that's very difficult for you, maybe even a crisis situation for yourself, maybe something difficult you're gonna do this week. If you plan for that and you figure out your little plan, even if you don't follow that plan, you're gonna have a better chance of it going the way that you want. But a lot of trauma survivors said, no, you know what? I finally wanna have a great day with my family at Disneyland. Unsafe parent or anybody, unsafe parent plus the excitement of Disneyland, what happens? Who's seen it at Disneyland? You know, you can't be an abusive parent and then take your child to Disneyland and boom, it all works out. Because that abusive parent is gonna be abusive at Disneyland. And even if they're not, it doesn't make up for the abuse that happened anyway. So who needs to go to Disneyland? Safe parents. 
who are able to keep their children safe at Disneyland and contain the unsafe enthusiasm that children often and adults often display in Disneyland. So here's some here's some tips on how to be uh, be safer in a plan, a plan to be safer. Visualize safety. What is safety? What does it feel like to be safe? Let your body know it. Know your rights. Most Americans don't know their rights. Know your rights, it's your protection. Write down a safety plan. Writing down a safety plan is safer, more planning than not. Update your safety plan regularly. We get older, we get more mature, things happen. Take a picture of your safety plan, send it via email, send it via text, upload it. If you wrote it, you can probably remember it, but guess what? You're probably not gonna end the crisis. Boom, there it is on your phone, have it. Your safety is worth it. Acknowledge your safety as your primary goal in life. It's not selfish because when you're safe, your children are safe. When your children are safe, your grandchildren are safe. It's actually very altruistic to focus on your own safety. Improve your observational skills, facts. Oh, it looks cold out there. Is that a fact? No, it's an opinion. What do I have to do in order to see how cold it is out there? Go outside. And then I use my senses. And usually what I say is, it's not nearly as cold as I thought it was. Or sometimes here in Utah, <laughs> it's a lot colder. Practice sensory awareness skills, your senses. Use them. This is why sports is so great. You have to use your senses. You can't, I play tennis. You can't watch the ball and think that you're gonna fail watching the ball at the same time. So now with tennis, which I think is a wonderful trauma treatment myself, check it out. Um, you know, I in the moment of hitting that ball, yoga, walking, art, all of these things allow you to practice your sensory awareness skills before something happens, when you're safe enough to do it. Educate yourself on safe resources, connections, and actions. Our country tells us if you're wealthy or rich or have money in the bank or a credit card, you don't really have to plan. You can just buy whatever you need, right? Um, but instead, I'm going to suggest all of us, but maybe especially those who think they already have what they need are those who need this plan the most. Another thing to plan to be safer, reduce unknowns increase knowns. What does this mean? I don't know what time we're leaving. I don't know what time we're showing up. I don't know who's coming. Well, I can, maybe I can find out some of that information, right? Or increase knowns, which is the same thing backwards. I know where I'm going. I know who's coming. I know what's going on. Notice what you know. Notice what you don't know. During so here's a phrase, a little bit different than um, millennial culture. Hold on to your hats, millennials. Triggers are your friends reminding you of your safety. Oh, that's different. Oh, that's different. Your body-based trigger or body signal is telling you that something's not safe. But if we think, oh, you know, it's external or, oh, you know, whatever, or, oh, I shouldn't be triggered. If we're not listening to what our body is telling us, then we don't know how to become safe. Your body is desperately trying to communicate to you right now. What is it saying? Leave. <laughs> so during a crisis, during a bad situation, listen to your gut. Reduce personal disclosures and therefore protect your personal information. Has anybody ever noticed that sometimes trauma survivors, when they're in the middle of a crisis, will tell anybody anything? Anything they, they need help, it's extreme. And all of a sudden, all my personal detail, here's my, here's my ATM, here's my password. Go and get me $50, okay? Next day, no money. I don't know if anybody's... Take safe action to protect yourself. 
This is so different than what most trauma survivors have heard, which is you shouldn't have gone there. You shouldn't have said that. You definitely shouldn't have done that. So can you see how trauma survivors get this message? Don't do anything, that that's the safest way to be, but it's the least safe in the middle of a crisis, right? Instead, safe actions. Do something to increase your safety. If you're not already familiar with seeking safety, there's 84 safe coping skills and I'll make sure that everybody gets you know, a copy. Yeah. We've already had requests for all your slides, but okay. yes, please, we'll send it all out. All right, great, great, great. So attuned to body-based signals and danger cues. Your body is talking to you way earlier than you realize. I know this because my dog pays attention to the environment all the time. She hears a lot better than me. And so she's immediately aware of what's going on. And then she's noticing, 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 and then eliminating you know, the safe and then focusing. And then all of a sudden she's sleeping. Me, I can be somewhere and not even notice that I have to use the restroom, that I'm totally dehydrated, that I'm about to pass out because that's how I've been socialized. Focus on the present, physical facts and your own safety. Focus on the present. What is happening now? Oh, if I don't get my life together, I'm not gonna have a retirement. I'm not, I'm gonna become homeless. You can see how the body just starts to react to all of those thoughts. What's happening now? Are you safe here? Check out your dog. Oh, well, might be safe here. Don't have to worry now. Distinguish between physical threats and emotional risks. Physical threat is somebody's coming closer to you and they have the capacity to harm you. What is an emotional risk is anything that's not that. Somebody that has a contrarian position. I think mental health sucks. It's not a physical threat. But for trauma survivors, very often vocalized opinions feel like threats and the body wants to defend themselves from it. By the same token, the, because of that, the trauma survivor often doesn't seek out new information, important information, because information can be escalating. And so they become less informed and more convinced and their mind closes. Rate how dangerous the situation is right now. Well, you can check out the dog. She's, she's rating it a zero, just so you know. But what would she be doing if she thought this was a 10? What would she be doing if she thought it was a five? You have that inner signal inside of you, but it's often been disconnected by history, by gender, by trauma. So we use in Seeking Safety zero, no danger, 10 the most. So we've got this kind of standard, it's the pain scale. I don't have a lot of time, but I feel compelled to finish here. Yeah, keep going, we're good. After, recover to be safer. Has anybody ever noticed that some trauma survivors, if they get through a situation, they're like, oh, get back to the rat race. Oh, whew. oh, good, okay, uh -huh. you know. Uh, that maybe death-defying acts were just, you know, engaged upon, engaged in, but now it's just back to business, right? Give yourself time. Assess what happened. Be factual. Be observant. Use your senses. Your body knows. Link with safe connections, hopefully ones you planned for earlier. Respond to physical needs first. The body needs to physically heal and then it has the energy in order to emotionally heal. Follow your emergency plan when needed. It is not a failure to follow a plan. What would they say in the military? I followed the plan, that's the failure, or I didn't follow the plan, and that's the failure. It's the not following the plan. I don't know about the military, but I'm assuming that's what they think, right? It's the failure not to follow your own plan. Plans don't always work out but they usually work out better than no plan at all. When safe, review and revise your safety plan. There, the more you use your own personal safety plan, the more you realize it works, the more you're going to give it to your clients. The more you give it to your clients, the more they're going to use it, the more they're going to see it works. Then they're going to give it to their kids. So see how safety works? It's not a zero-sum game. It's ever-expanding. Give yourself more time, more distance. Give yourself time. 
But our culture, and this I can say, our dominant culture says, not only do you not have time, you're late. You better hurry up and heal, get working, get functioning, get doing. Definitely stop complaining. Speak to an expert victim advocate to start an exit plan. An exit plan from chaos, an exit plan from unsafety, from danger, an exit plan from a violent relationship, from a gang, an exit plan from suicide. Measure reductions in unsafe behaviors to track trauma recovery. How do I know I'm in trauma recovery? It's when my unsafe behaviors are lessening, right? How do I know trauma is ramping back up in me? My unsafe behaviors go through the roof. But it's not the elimination of the unsafe behavior. It's the observation and measurement of it that is compassionate to yourself. It came from somewhere and it probably helped you survive. File a state victim compensation claim for out-of-pocket uh, and lost wages. So this is something that a lot of trauma survivors don't know, that there is a fund of money that you can tap into if you've been criminally harmed. And a lot of trauma survivors figure there's no help, faulty belief, lack of information, adverse practice. So remember this, risky behaviors measure the problem, but are not the problem. Restricting your food, how, how intensely are you restricting your food? That is measuring how intense trauma is inside of you. But it's not the problem. It's not, oh, I intuitively eat, now I don't have trauma. It's you become safer and you don't have to restrict so much. You become safer and you don't have to use drugs so much. As a matter of fact, when you become safer, you create visceral homeostasis and the toxic sub substance has the toxic effect without the positive effect. So then your body's like, wow, I don't even like this stuff anymore. I've seen clients week after week say this. I don't want to stop smoking pot. Okay. I'm going to stop smoking pot. Okay. In the course of successful recovery, it should be possible to recognize a gradual shift from unpredictable, unacknowledged danger to reliable and measurable safety, from dissociated trauma to acknowledged and restored memories, from stigmatized isolation to a sense of safety around other human beings. And folks, that indeed is the way that we can open our eyes to our own sense of safety, our own need for safety, that you deserve it. And the more you nourish and nurture your sense of safety, the more you can nourish it in your clients. And then we can open our hearts safely and not be hurt when people do dangerous things to themselves or bad things happen to people that we care about. And then we can open our minds and realize that there's a lot more to learn. Uh, with that, everybody, I want to do a quick shout out for 988. If you haven't tried it, call it up yourself, see how it works. And with that, everybody, I'm only three or 13 minutes late. Thank you very, very much. Oh, Gabriel. Okay, well, you can see why we brought her back. <laughs> um, there's, uh, let's still take five minutes for questions because um, it's really valuable. And then I know that there's, um, you might be getting asked to come back and do a training. Like, I feel like we need, yeah, a virtual seeking safety training. February 22nd, virtually. February 22nd, virtually. Oh my goodness. So we'll try to put that information out also in the um, in email that everyone will receive who registered for this. Okay, questions. Uh, anyone in the room have a question? I'm going to go back and monitor the chat. Sometimes it takes a second to think of questions when there's been so much. Let's see here. Lots of thank yous. Um, online and lots of great materials. We're all going to get it. I think people are ready to go. <laughs> you think people are ready to go? I mean, I'm Here's... just going to read the behavior. <laughs> okay. Here's one. Do, um, does her center yeah. specialize in certain types of trauma? Yeah. Feel free to get up if your body is in need of it, you know, um, but feel free to stick around if your body can handle it. Um, so the answer really within seeking safety, which is the treatment that I do 
it is any trauma, any substance, any trauma, any substance. So the substance is really any unsafe behavior, but it's compulsive self-destructive behavior. It's not just like drinking too many, you know, Cokes. It's really drinking so many Cokes that you're drowning yourself. So we're really in that kind of extreme side of things, but it's any trauma. Now, what are the most unacknowledged traumas? Those are usually the ones that are, uh, you know, causing the most stuff. So, you know, I often have, oh, you know something, my mother died. You know, she was 94. I love my mother very much. Okay. You know, that's tough, but it's acknowledged. You see that? this person is still engaging in unsafe behaviors. There's an unacknowledged trauma there, but keep in mind that the goal is not to uncover it. Aha, I found the hope diamond. It is to become safer, safer around it, safer around what is unknown and unacknowledged. And that safety will then finally allow it to be acknowledged. And it doesn't matter anyway, because we're safer. Should that be the last question? It certainly can be. Uh... Yes, so hang on here just a second. The bladder is like, no! <laughs> I know. <laughs> you should bring your dog over. What a sweet, yeah. All right, um, that is the last question for now. People can find you, plus we'll have follow-ups. Gabriella, that's a, a warm applause for all her great contributions. And for our private speech. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not quite done, but yes, I am within one minute of being done. So what a day. Um, it's always a fantastic symposium. Thank you to everyone who attends, everyone who's engaged, ask questions. And um, thank you for the great work that you are doing as individuals. You're doing a great work, no matter what, what your role is. And we need you. Um, you. In your folders, there is an evaluation form. Maybe there's a way it goes out to the online people too, yes. So um, like, like we said, we use these to plan for next year and the future years. We especially need to know of really great um, speakers who fit this category. So um, you know, be brainstorming, be watching for these kinds of people and let us know. And last but not least, uh, for all who have attended in person, we do have lunch for you. So it's right outside the door. You can grab it and go, or you can come back and eat in this room and visit some more. Thank you so much. Have a great year and day.